Greetings. I am Jonathan Bagger, CEO of the American Physical Society, and I am delighted to welcome you to the Kavli Foundation Special Symposium at the 2021 March meeting. On behalf of APS, I would like to thank the Foundation for making possible this important plenary session at the American Physical Society's largest annual meeting. This year's topic, machine learning and quantum computation, should be of great interest to us all. It holds the potential to transform physics in a way that will shake us to our very foundations. Huge new questions are opened up, ranging from what is a physical law to what constitutes empirical proof. It is an exciting time to be a physicist and an exciting time to be alive. Tonight, we are fortunate to have five distinguished speakers to take us on a journey through this new space. We will be guided by Professor Dan Arovas from UC San Diego, past chair of DCMP and the organizer of this event. Dan, over to you. All right. Um... Thank you, uh, John, and uh, welcome as our, our new CEO of APS. Um, so yes, this is the uh, Kavli Symposium. Uh, I'm actually going to be co-chairing this session with my uh, colleague, um, Professor Mohammed Sultanye Ha from Boston University. Um, Mohammed uh, is the founding chair and uh, the uh, current past chair, if indeed such a collocation makes sense, of the, the newest uh, unit of APS, the topical group on data science. And we're hoping there will be many people in the audience uh, interested in data science. And Mohammed at, at, at uh, one or two points will flash a, a, a slide um, showing some of the uh, GDS events going on during the March meeting and uh, how, how you can get involved with GDS. We have um, five distinguished speakers here, and so um, without ado, I'd like to um, uh, I'd like to start. Um, so our first speaker um, is Patrick Francis Riley from Google. We'll be talking about vignettes of machine learning in the natural sciences. Um, I will uh, just read uh, his uh, uh, bio blurb over here, and you can all look at the abstract. Um, Patrick Riley is a principal engineer and a senior researcher of the applied science team at Google Research. His team collaborates with science, scientists across organizations to apply Google's knowledge and experience in machine learning and data science to important problems in the natural sciences. Much of his recent work has focused on machine learning applications for the chemistry of small molecules, especially for drug discovery, but has worked in fields as varied as material science, protein design, and nuclear fusion. He received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University studying artificial He spent the first part of his 16 years at Google in web search, where he developed search features and led efforts on search logs collection and analysis of user behavior. So Patrick, please uh, share your, your slide deck and uh, Let's start. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for the, uh, the kind introduction. And it's really a great honor uh, to be here tonight and get the chance to talk about probably my favorite topic, which is the uses of machine learning in the natural sciences. Since um, I'm coming from a you know, somewhat unusual um, uh, place here coming from uh, coming coming from Google Research. I thought I should just tell you a little bit about about what it means, what our group does, and we really do have this very broad mission of bringing whatever computational techniques we can to all kinds of natural science domains. And when I first started doing this uh, five or six years ago, I usually had to spend a lot of time explaining to people why there was an opportunity to use machine learning for natural science problems, why there was a, a benefit to be had. Nowadays, I don't, I don't have to do that anymore. I think probably everyone here has you know, heard um, so much about the use of machine learning to learn more in, in these science domains. And, you know, there, and we're even probably now much further along in the hype cycle um, where there's a, a lot less convincing that has to be done. 
And so what I want to do to, uh, this evening is to, to give you two examples of work that we've done that illustrate sort of two uh, kind of different pictures about how you need to think about using machine learning effectively in the natural sciences. So the first one uh, is a is a pro is a project that we've uh, that we did sort of reach a major uh, significant milestone uh, over, over the last uh, eighteen months, and it's still an ongoing concern for us. This is uh, machine learning with DNA and encoded library data. If you don't know what that means, don't worry; it'll all make sense in a few minutes. So the context for this whole uh, problem is thinking about small molecule drug discovery. So you know you are probably familiar with many of the uh, the molecules I've put up here, even if you've never uh, looked at the chemical structure, the chemical um, structures like this before. But the discovery of molecules which have therapeutic effects is one is a a, a truly uh, difficult problem to improve human health and and lots of technology uh, both in the physical realm and in the computational realm has been applied to this over many many years. And we, and this is also a very natural machine learning problem once you, once you approach it in the right way. So in order to understand, uh, understand a little bit about what happens during drug discovery, I need to define this word hit that you talk, that, uh, you, you talk about in the discovery process. And when I use this word hit, all I mean is that you have some molecule which has a biochemical effect on a, on a protein that you think is relevant to your disease. And so there, this is really um, uh, the kind of the very beginning of a drug discovery process is finding some molecule that has any activity. Because if you just picked out random molecules, essentially none of them will do what you want them to do. And so even finding any place to get started in the drug discovery process is important. And this is this process called hit finding. And what we really wanna do is do is apply the best technology we can to get the best hits that we can. So just for a sense of scale, uh, to, so you have some idea about the, the, the difficulty of this problem, if you look at the total number of small molecules that have ever been tested in human beings for being safe and efficacious, we're, we're somewhere in the 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 4 realm. If you, you know, many of you have probably heard or seen videos about these really, truly amazing high throughput screening systems that uh, a number of different places have set up where you have robots go through and test a whole bunch of individual compounds to try to find these hits. But with these really advanced systems, you can test something like 10 to the five or 10 to the six compounds. But the estimates of the number of molecules that we would like to consider searching here are some, something like 10 to the 33rd. There's a bit of debate about exactly what this number is, but we're sure that it very much dwarfs our ability to physically test uh, to physically test molecules. So, what do we do when we have this huge gap between what we can physically test and uh, the number of compounds we would like to consider? So, let me talk to you about a technology that really helps us address this in an interesting way. And this this is a technology called DNA encoded small molecule libraries. So the way a lot of small molecules are made are by assembling are, are by assembling them from other fragments. So here I've shown I've shown a couple of fragments of small molecules, and these uh, reaction handles here I've circled in red. You know, under appropriate conditions, they you know they will fuse and form the molecule over here on the right, as well as some side products. And what's interesting is you can often find many different chemical components that have similar reaction handles on them. So this allows you to do some really interesting stuff. So now I'm going to abstract things slightly. I'm going to take away all the uh, interesting part of the chemistry, just replace it with these abstract shapes, but leave in those, uh, those reaction handles. So here's the way you, you create a DNA encoded small molecule library. So you start with one of these fragments so that, that, I, that I have up, up here in blue. And um, in addition to the reaction handle, you attach a little strip of DNA that you're using as a barcode to identify this little fragment of a molecule. You then take this blue, the, this little uh, blue chunk of chemistry, and you combine it with um, with all with all of your other uh, chunks of chemistry, all these orange ones over here, and you add in a unique barcode for each of those orange ones. And if you do this repeatedly across all these fragments, you can see that you can very quickly generate a very large number of different small molecules, all that have DNA DNA tags that uniquely identify what molecule that is. And so what's really uh, um, uh, interesting about this technology, once you have all these things, you can actually use it to do a physical experiment. So you can get something like, you know, say 10 to the 11 uh, uh, molecules through this process. And then what you do with them is you go and you put them all in one tube. Now, 
I should say I've drawn this as an Erlenmeyer flask here on this on on uh, uh, on the slide. We don't actually use an Erlenmeyer for flask for this. It's a much smaller uh, setting, but I but I, I used it here to to give myself the space to illustrate this illustrate what's going on. So you take all these molecules you've generated with all these D these DNA tags, and then you add in some protein that you're interested in. And so typically small molecules will work by binding to a protein, by sticking to that protein. And so most of the, um, or some of the small molecules will stick to your protein of interest, but most of them won't. And so you, you'll, you let them sit there, go through that binding process, wash away everything that, uh, that did not bind, and then pull, and then with a little bit of uh, uh, sort of physical purification steps, you extract all the DNA of what's left left over, and you, then you get the barcodes for all the small molecules that stuck to your protein. And in this way, you can test experimentally a very large number of molecules against your protein target. It gives you access to doing a physical testing at a scale that we simply didn't have before. So if I come back to my uh, uh, the the scale I was talking about before, you know, if I create one of these very large DNA encoded libraries, it's great. It's still quite a bit bigger than what we could do with our traditional high throughput screening, but it's still you know, vastly smaller than uh, than the the number of small molecules we would actually like to consider. So by this point, I'm sure it's very clear what you're going to do here. You have this great volume of data coming from the DNA encoded library screen, and now we're going to add add ML into this process. And so I'm not going to go into some of the details about how you process all the, the, the DNA sequencing and produce these positive and negative signals for individual small molecules. There's a bunch of fun details in there if you, if you like that sort of thing, but I'm going to skip over it for the purpose of this talk. But what, what we did here then is to take all of that data and to put it into two different ML models. And the, the two models I'm going to talk about here are a graph convolutional neural network. The details here, again, are not super important. This is a neural network that we've uh, developed over the last few years, and graph convolutional neural networks are now a very active area of research with a lot of great things happening. And we compared this to a random forest on this, uh, on this representation called ECFP. And the important thing to know about this is this is kind of the, the, the default standard thing that you would do if you were um, had a chem informatics problem like this. It's very much kind of a workhorse of, uh, of, uh, for this kind of predictions. And so by training these models, what we can then do is instead of just finding hits from that DNA encoded library, from that 10 to the 11 that we were able to synthesize in the library, we can then go make predictions on any other chemical library we want. And so in particular here in this uh, process, we went and we screened a bunch of libraries that were very easy to acquire, either because they could be made very easily or they were easy or they were already on somebody's shelf. And so once we uh, rank predictions on these, on these very large libraries, we go through a bunch of, uh, of automated or automatable filters to go and pick a small set of compounds to actually test, run experiments on, and figure out, and figure out which ones actually bind. And one thing that I want to point out here that uh, that I think is important is this in that in that in this bottom box over here. I'm highlighting that what we that what we did here is automate is an, really an automated process. And one of, and this is because we really wanted to make sure we knew how well the machine learning is working. It's fairly common in this kind of setup to have a review of your predictions uh, by expert chemists in order to make sure the model is not is not doing anything anything crazy and to really pick what they think is the best. Here we didn't do that. We did strictly this uh, this uh, automated or automatable process so that we could really see how good the machine learning model was, uh, mostly on its own. So, how does this actually work? So, we actually did a, what is an extremely large prospective study. So the whole process that I just described for you, we ran three different times on three, diff on three different protein targets, with the names of which are, are on the slide here. And now what I'm showing here are how potent, uh, how well those small molecules bound to our protein target of interest. Ideally, we would see um, we would the, um, the, the dark colors are more potent, more desirable molecules. Now, there's something really important about this figure. When we were making this, uh, it was very important to me that we had the x-axis of this go all the way to 100%. And the reason is because for most, most times that you go through this virtual screening process, you will be nowhere near 100%. The fact that I can have a scale bar that goes to 100% and you can still see my results is actually is a fairly remarkable thing for this kind of, for this kind of virtual screening. 
The other thing you might notice here is that I have the, there's two lines here comparing the graph convolutional neural network to the to the random forest. And 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 here we see that the graph convolutional neural network significantly outperforms the random forest. Now, this may not surprise a lot of people, but this is actually a really important point about this work. So we have been working on these kinds of molecular, um, uh, this kind of representation for, for a while, but this was really the first case we saw where these, the, the more complex model outperformed the simple standard thing by a meaningful amount. And I think this is a really important thing to think about. There's so much excitement about what to do with machine learning and wanting to use the fanciest methods for everything. But in most cases, you really don't need the, you don't need the biggest uh, and fanciest things in order to have, a really, to have a really effective system. This was one of the cases where we really did start to see that, to see that benefit. So the other thing that I think was really interesting about this model is when we started to look at how well did it generalize? So there's a lot of, uh, uh, let me just tell you what's going on, the, on on this slide. So here, again, I have this potency that, you know, how well the small molecules bound. Oh, now it's on the y-axis with down being better. And on the x-axis of these plots are the similarity to the training data. And here, what we're seeing is that the, um, that the model is working even across, even as the molecules get quite dissimilar to my original training data, that there really is some interesting generalization going on here. So this was a really great uh, uh, you know, research result. We didn't know how well this was gonna work. The question is, what are we gonna do with this? How are we gonna make the world a better place with this? And so to understand this, I, the, I need to introduce this concept of a chemical probe. And this is a, a quote from one of the, the well-known websites that uh, catalogs these, kind, these chemical probes. But essentially a chemical probe is just a small molecule that allows you to ask biological questions in reasonable ways. But unfortunately, despite how useful these things would be, many, many disease-relevant proteins lack these chemical probes. And so on the basis of this work, we've started, we've started this new project that we've called Chemome to discover many, many chemical probes. And the basic idea is we go through this process I've described to you, where we do the DNA, where we do the DNA encoded library screening based on proteins provided by academics, go through this uh, machine learning process, by a small number of molecules that those can then, can then be validated by the original academics. And this is, the goal here is really to find, uh, find chemical probes for many thousands of proteins. So this is kind of the, the end of the, of the first part of this. And I think this, is, uh, this was a, a really important result for seeing that the, um, there are cases where these modern methods really can um, outperform, but it's also, there's also a lesson in here that it's really important to compare to the, the simplest thing out there and make sure you're, you're, you don't uh, add in unnecessary complexity and only use the more complex methods when they really provide um, some real value. So I want to shift gears here and now talk about uh, uh, talk about a very different kind of project with a very different kind of technology um, uh, underlying it. And now we're going to go in and talk about uh, density functional theory and the cone sham equations. So the underlying technology of this is something called differentiable programming. And there's a quote here from Wikipedia that's describing it, but this is probably not going to be too unfamiliar to, to most people here. The idea is that you write a program such that you can automatically compute derivatives for that program. And the reason you would do that is that so much of what, we're do, what we see with modern, modern uh, neural networks are training by gradient descent. Gradient descent has been a you know, surprisingly effective way um, uh, in order to fit very, very complex models. And so in all kinds of scientific computing and, and uh, machine learning, you see the use of gradient descent built on automatic differentiation. And this is where I think there's actually an interesting change in point of view. You know, for a while people think, well, neural networks, that's just, you know, I do, I add a few neurons and that's it. But differentiable programming is really, um, just, you know, as, as Jan McCoon says, just a rebranding of what, of what is, in a, uh, is in a lot of deep learning. Um, and the idea is that we are combining not just you know, single neurons, not just layers of, of uh, identical neurons, but all kinds of interesting computational steps that we can do automatic differentiation through. So the basic idea with automatic differentiation is that if I write my program out, right, and here I've drawn a very, very simple uh, mathematical equation, you can step-by-step 
you know, the automatically determine the gradients at each point that allow you to do things like compute gradients of how should I change X if I want to uh, improve, if I want to, if I want to increase F. And this is something that, um, that many, many current software systems allow you to do. So now let's go and talk about the physics part of this. And, and, uh, let's, and, and we're going to talk about density functional theory. So, you know, as I'm sure uh, many people here know, you know, going through the sort of full solution or even fully representing a wave function is a, a almost impossibly uh, difficult task for any real system and solve and solving these things directly would be quite expensive, though I believe you're going to hear about some other ways to accelerate um, uh, uh, computation, some, some computations like this. And so density functional theory is really kind of an amazing uh, step in here where you move from having to talk about the entire wave function, which is a much bigger object, to just talking about the density of electrons in the ground state. And the Honigberg cone theorems are what allow you uh, or show that you could actually do this kind of connection. So let's go into um, a, a little bit more about what DFT is and, and, how it, and how this actually works. So first of all, you know, this is in, for those of you who have not already used this, this has been a spectacularly successful uh, uh, theory and set of software and made all kinds of interesting predictions. This is a, a graph from uh, Kieran Burke and, and authors, which I still love the y-axis of kilo papers per year uh, published <laughs> using junction, density functional theory. So. You know, there's an important step. And now we're going to kind of dive into some uh, important details in here. The way that density functional theory is often done today is by using these cone sham equations. And here, the energy functional, this E, so the energy as a function of the density, uh, as a function of the density, is broken out into all these terms. We're going to ignore most of these for a second. Um, the only ones I want to highlight are this uh, kinetic energy term and then this thing that we call the exchange correlation uh, term over here. And what you do in cone sham DFT is that you are going through these, um, these equations that where you have this eigenvalue problem to solve. So you, you, compute, you compute the density and the effective potential. And then based on, based on that, you go back and you, re, and, and you have to recompute the density. And so here, these iterative steps where you start off with, uh, uh, with, a, with this uh, potential from the, all these other terms, from all these other terms here, which all depend on the density, you then use that you use, use that to go back and recompute the density. And so now you have this classic chicken and egg problem where you need the density to compute the potential, but you need the potential to compute the density. So what do we do here? We do the very natural thing of, uh, of doing, of, uh, doing a, a repeated calculation in order to get to a self-consistent answer. And so uh, what I'm showing here in this center box is a schematic of how this computation evolves. So you imagine at one step, you have a, you have a density come in, that's the N sub KN. Uh, you, you have your XC potential that I mentioned before, as well as these other terms, which are much easier to compute. You then, uh, that, that gives you this KS potential, you solve the, you do this eigenvalue problem, you get the new density, you recompute the energy, and, the, and you have this new density coming out. Now, what's a, what I want to uh, point out here is then go through a number of, of steps until this eventually converges and you converge on a density which is self-consistent. And, and that is the, the self-consistent calculation which is at the heart of density functional theory. Now, the, um, the important thing is that blue box that I showed over here, this XC potential, that really tricky part of this whole thing. The other terms are, are well understood, and we kind of put all of the messiness of this down into this XC potential, and that's where all the approximation is, and that's where all, that's where all the excitement is. And really, you know, this is where many, many people have developed lots of forms of this, of, of this exchange correl correlation functional. And there's many different versions of this. Sometimes you will hear this term of the Jacobs ladder of, uh, of, of, exchange, uh, of exchange correlation. And many, many things have been, de have been developed. So let me now bring together these two ideas, the differentiable programming idea, and then the cone-sham self-consistent calculation. So as you probably realize, here, I can take that calculation I just described with all of these well-understood, physically motivated steps. and and, and back propagate could do the automatic differentiation in order to get derivatives of everything along the way. And the reason I'm going to do that, then this blue box, this complicated exchange correlation potential, I'm then going to approximate that with a, with a, with a little neural network. 
But be, but the interesting thing is, this is not a neural network like you may have thought about. Well, I put something in, I go through a couple of neurons. The neural network is embedded in this physically inspired uh, set of computation that I can still differentiate through. And this is where I think there's a real change in thinking about when we talk about software 2.0, this is the kind of change that we're, that, we're, that we're thinking about. There's many physically inspired things in here. And then there's a little part of it that we're gonna put in there. And then we're gonna we're, we're learn the automatic differentiation and gradient descent. Now, the interesting thing here is there's actually a lot of connections to things going on uh, uh, in, the machine in the machine learning world where these self-consistent iterations look a lot like concepts that come up also um, inside of uh, the deep learning community. I'll point out one thing here, which is it's standard to do this step called density mixing, where when you recompute the density at one step, you don't just move completely to it, but you mix together the density of, that you started with and the density that came out of an iteration. And for folks that are familiar with the deep learning world, you'll recognize this as exactly the same thing you get with these things called residual connections. So many good ideas will be discovered in multiple forms. So how do we actually uh, how do we actually train this thing? How do we, how do we actually get to a result? And the key thing is to define what the loss function is. I mean, this is the way you tell the model what is it you're trying to do. And there's two things that would be true. First is that if this would if the if the XE was exactly correct, then the final density would come out. And I want to point out for all of this work. We're using, um, uh, well, we're using a density uh, computed for this training from something called DMRG, which really, you know, which really, uh, really, really is, we can treat as an exact as an exact density. So that's our training signal coming in with this exact density. And then the other part is the energies coming out that computed by DMRG should match the energies that we that we compute. So that is the, the signal that we're giving this whole system saying, please produce something where the final density is correct and the, and the energies are correct. So again, this is a, a bit of a shift in thinking. Most of the uh, functionals that have been developed have you know, a, a form that is sort of derived but with physical intuition and they have a very small number of parameters to fit. Here, we've sort of put the whole system together and you know, we've the structure of the computation comes from our understanding of physics, but then we may have a whole lot of parameters to fit along the way that we then fit with gradient descent. And that is what we call these neural XC functionals. So I'm gonna skip, I think this is a less important point. So I'm gonna skip over this and just go and jump straight to, and jump straight to the results. So what, we've, what I'm now going to show you here are we've done this, you know, in, in sort of a, a classic physics way. We've done this with a, you know, started off with a one-dimensional chemistry. Um, and so what you, are, what you are seeing here is a, is a binding curve for a one-dimensional H2. So if, if, uh, if we had a one-dimensional world and you had two hydrogens, the, uh, X, the X axis here is the, is the separation of those hydrogens and the Y axis is the energy. And so the dashed line here is the uh, true binding curve. And that's where you would see this sort of, well, we talk about the kind of uh, the bond length is this, it would be this well down here at the bottom of, uh, uh, of, that, of that dotted line. And so the one on the, the, the figure on the left is showing what happens if you use a lot of the kind of very traditional, how people have fit um, energies for molecules uh, and, uh, and given this training data, and here the training data are these two uh, sort of orange diamonds. And then we also use this black, uh, this black triangle to pick the best model during training. And you can see basically that the, the orange curve that is learned here, this is the best curve that comes out of that direct ML method is really a pretty poor fit to this overall binding curve. Where if we, if you look at what's going on over here for this KRSR global, this is the result of the work we have here. You can see it essentially perfectly matches the uh, the binding curve given. Now all those gray lines there, those are the the models that are explored during the training process, and so that's that you can see the kind of progress of the training process as it goes in and and uh, and and finds a good model. The other thing that's uh, that's interesting to examine here is the density. So remember, what comes out of this thing is not just the energy that I'm showing on the left hand side, but is also the density. So so, so uh, what I'm uh, what I'm going to show talking about here is what kinds of densities are explored, and this gets to another really important point about how this actually works. So let me explain this figure, and then I'll, I'll tell you why this is so interesting. So let's uh, just focus on the plot, uh, the A plot over here on the left. 
So I'm uh, sort of projected these these um, high, these these densities down into this 2D plane using this technique called T-SME that some of you may be familiar with. But just think about it as this is something where points near each other have similar densities. The, the, the X up here at the top is the density that we start with. And the T equals zero is what happens on the before the model has been trained at all, uh, but we go through these, these iterative cone sham calculations. You can see that it gets to a density which is really nothing like the true density, which is way down here in the corner. But then if you go to the blue or the purple lines here, this, this is now the progression of densities that, that the model that, the, that you go through as you go through these self-consistent cone sham calculations. So realize here there's two different iterations going on. You uh, are, are going through and solving the self-consistent calculations that produces a number of different densities along the way. And then, and then we're also then taking a number of steps of training the model. And this is something that I think is really interesting about this. And the reason that we call this a cone sham regularizer is that the, uh, the set of densities that are explored during the training process is in effect a kind of regularizer for the model. It tells the model, you don't need to figure out to, to produce the correct energy and the predict gradient of the energies for this one final answer. I need you to produce the correct, um, uh, the, the, uh, a good den a gradient for the energy for all of these intermediate densities. And that is an interesting regularization effect that I didn't say explicitly in some way. I couldn't say exactly what the regularization term is there, but it has a real powerful effect on the way that the model is working. So the other thing that I think is really interesting about this is even though we train it just with, you know, in this case with an H2 and an H4 molecule, that's what you see up here on the top. When we take other variants of this, configurations that were not really seen in training, we can still get very good accuracy down close, uh, close to or better than this, uh, this chemical accuracy line that's uh, often, often considered of one kcal per mole, um, even with very, very few training examples. So one thing I just want to highlight from Physio, notice we had three training examples for those H2, right? And we're, but because of the effect of solving those iterative cone sham calculations, we can really make the most out of those very limited training points. And you can see for the, the, the cases that I'm showing here, um, the, the, the full binding curves for all, for a bunch of these molecules over here on the, over here on the right side. And again, our technique does a very good job matching that even for uh, configurations that were not seen during training. The last thing I'll point out, you may notice that we used both the energy and the density during this, during this training process. And this is, it turns out to be really important. We experimented a lot with what, you know, what if we could only use the energy and what, and the, the net effect of this, which you can see is that, again, the true answer is here in this dashed line. And when we have the density, we do a much, much better job matching, you know, we do much, much better job reproducing it than if all we're given is, the, is that energy signal. So let me uh, just kind of wrap this part up and then leave you with some final thoughts. So I think what's interesting about this, this is really a proof of principle about uh, this kind of deep integration of uh, a physical intuition into, into, a, into a machine and machine learning. And what's important here is that we talk a lot about how do I incorporate physics in my model? And what people almost always are going to is how do I get the symmetries I know of the world into my ML model? But there's so much more that can be done for how I incorporate uh, my physical knowledge into an ML powered system. And this, uh, this the, the, the differentiable program is really powering this kind of change. So let me leave you with just a, a, a final thought. So many of you may recognize this drawing style. This is a, an XKCD comic. Many of the kind of CS and AI folks will, will, will love this, uh, uh, this particular web comic. Um, this is one from a few years ago. And I think uh, you know, if, uh, if this had been written today, I'm sure that the word algorithms there would have been replaced by AI because of all the, the hype we're seeing, we're seeing in the field. And, I th and this is uh, you know, something that we have really experienced here that it's really important for as computational folks like myself really Really come into problems that really appreciate the underlying uh, uh, complexity and work deeply with all of the experts uh, in domains. And this has been a really uh, a fun experience for me and my me and my team to do. So with that, I will happily take some questions. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. We'll uh, I'll, I'll leave your uh, slide deck up here uh, in case you're going to refer to to any of them. I want to tell people in the audience that. 
you should be uh, upvoting the questions that you want to see answered first. Uh, and, and you can, uh, you should be able to, to do that in your window. Um, uh, so uh, let's just go to, go to the questions. Um, the winning question thus far is, how do you make sure that you are not overfitting the exchange correlation neural networks? So the, um, the, I mean, there's a, there's a simple answer and a difficult answer. The simple answer is the, um, we, you know, when I said we're training with three, with three points here, um, we're using two points during training and then we use one point or, you know, you know, kept, we go to a couple more uh, in order to pick the best model that was learned so far. And so that sort of model selection step is really important for getting good results. Um, the, you know, the, the broader question of how do you avoid overfitting? This is always the problem. I think what is really interesting here, and part of the reason I think this system is really interesting, is that it really makes very good use of this data because it don't it, you the model doesn't just have to get those single points correct; it has to have an exchange correlation potential that is able to you know lead the computation to the right density, and that is a much stronger constraint than just saying for this object can you produce this energy. And so I think that structure really, really helps with the overfitting problem here, which is why I think it's so interesting. All right, thank you. Um, uh, next question, uh, DMRG really works only in one spatial dimension. Why do you take it as the ground truth? Well, so here's where we, you know, we the, the, the great trick of this paper of doing this proof of principle, we're operating in 1D here. Right, so everything I'm showing you here is for a 1D world. So that is why I can treat DMRG as exact. Um, now, I will point out that you know since this paper came out, there's already a paper on the archive that has implemented a 3D differentiable DFT. Um, and so this is that is where I think this needs to go to see how you can really do for um, computing this on real uh, on systems that'll that are that are real and will be interesting chemically. What is the advantage of using DFT plus ML over DMRG? So here, if you're doing it in 1D, if we lived in a 1D world, you should use DMRG. Um, the way I would think about this is this is a proof that this kind of structure will work so that we can build our way up to the more interesting things where I can't treat, uh, where I don't have a simple way to get to an exact to, uh, to get to an exact answer. And that it, and that I think is the the, the fun stuff that will happen now. Um, you didn't talk about molecules beyond ones containing hydrogen. How well does your exchange correlation functional compare to existing functionals for a larger set of molecules? Uh, and and what, there, I think the answer is very few people like to compute on one dimensional chemistry. Um, so I would very, I think this is uh, the way to think about this is this is really that proof of concept, the demonstration that this system would work and could be very data efficient. The question of how well it's going to work as we get to the, as we get to the world that we actually inhabit is that is, that is going to be some fun stuff. How good is the uh, ML functional for energy derivatives like forces and phonon energies? So, um, so we haven't tested it um, exactly for doing forces, but I think the, the key thing is when you look at what's going on with the density trajectories, you know that the functional has to be better than just arbitrarily reproducing the energy at a point because it is able to the sort of uh, derivative that's pointed out by the functional through density space is, um, is clearly better than just reproducing that, that, that single point. Um, in the DFT ML model, what are the parameters to optimize and what are the hyperparameters? So, um, yeah, so I kind of, I jumped over uh, this part, this part a little bit about what the actual neural network was here. So let me just get this window out of the way here. So the neural network sort of uh, uh, shown uh, uh, schematically over here on the right hand side. If you're familiar with neural networks, none of this stuff will be too surprising. We have a bunch of, you know, there's some convolutional layers. We picked it, we picked a particular activation function because of its, um, because it was uh, differentiable, uh, uh, Sorry, it was it, because of its different different differentiability. Um, but each of those layers that I've shown in here, the global convolution, the convolution, there's a bunch of parameters in there, and that's what's being fit uh, al along the way. Here are the parameters inside of these layers that I've uh, talked about: this convolution and the global convolution uh, layer. There. 
All right, thank you. I think we're, we're, we're now just about at our time limit. I think we're gonna have to move on to the next talk. There are several other questions, uh, you know, in the, in the, in, in the, uh, um, in, in the hopper. Um, I'm hoping, uh, Patrick, that you'll be able to, to um, stay for some of the post-session networking. Uh, but now let me turn it over to my co- uh, thank you very much, host, uh, you. Professor. Yeah, thank you very much for a beautiful talk. Uh, turn it over to uh, Professor uh, Sultania Ha. Thank you, Professor Aravas. Um, actually, all right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Roger Melko. Uh, Dr. Melko's research interests involve strongly correlated many body, many body systems with a focus on emergent phenomena, ground state phases, phase transitions, quantum criticality, and entanglement. He's particularly involved in studying microscopic models that display new and interesting quantum behavior in the bulk, such as superconducting, spin liquid and topological phases. He's also interested in broader ideas in computational physics, the development of, of efficient algorithms for simulating quantum mechanical systems on classical computers and the relationship of these methods to the fields of quantum information science and artificial intelligence. Roger, please take it away. Thank you, Mohammed. Am I coming through? Can you just give me a thumbs up? <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Okay, well, it's a you know it's a, a really an honor um, I got to say to uh, be giving a the Cavley Symposium here at the APS March meeting, um, and I, I will be talking about machine learning and what I'm calling the complexity of, of quantum simulation. Um, and I would like to start by thanking our other chair Dan Rovis uh, for everything he's done for us in this session, and also you know all the tough decisions uh, that he he made last year uh, during you know the uh, outbreak. Um, of the pandemic. And Dan, I don't know if you remember taking this video, but of course, <laughs> no. of course you don't, because that's a deep fake, Dan. Yeah. So what is this? This is a deep fake of, uh, uh, you know, which is uh, I created by essentially just taking a picture of Dan off of uh, the APS website, which is a very limited data set. And, you know, running that through a generative model, uh, specifically a generative adversarial network, a GAN, and new dynamical information is being generated by that GAN on the right, okay? So this, this kind of deep fake, um, you, you know, type of um, uh, generation is, is really highlighting what, what I wanna focus my talk on and that's generative models and machine learning. So instead of, uh, you know, instead of generating new uh, data for Dan, I'm actually gonna show you how generative models can be used to enhance quantum simulation. And when I say the word quantum simulation, there's two things that probably come to mind to this audience. Uh, you know, for condensed matter theorists or physicists like myself, uh, when I talk about quantum simulation, I typically mean com computer simulations, uh, you know, that are driven by a Hamiltonian or some similar knowledge. So I'm going to call that the Hamiltonian driven setting for quantum simulation. And typically we have uh, you know, like a Hamiltonian that has a strongly interacting piece, maybe some quantum fluctuations like this transversalizing model. And we're interested in equilibrium or dynamical properties. The equilibrium properties could be, you know, what is the ground state wave function associated with that? What are the, you know, low lying excitations? What are the topological, uh, you know, defects or invariants? But I don't want to restrict myself to the ground state problem. Uh, I actually want to think about dynamical, uh, you know, evolution of a state. Uh, perhaps through some unitary, some time evolution or something like that. And I'm going to call all these Hamiltonian driven simulation settings. And really what I'm doing is, you know, this is kind of the traditional simulation when I, when I, uh, you know, simulate a quantum system. However, I also want to define another setting, which I'm calling a data driven setting. And by data driven, I'm assuming that I have prepared, uh, you know, some strongly interacting quantum system uh, in either, you know, a, a quantum computer or some quantum, what's called a simulator. And if you're a quantum information person, this might be how you use, you know, the word simulation. And that has to be a highly controlled quantum device, which I'll show you why. And I've just shown a snapshot of the kind of data that you would get out of these modern quantum simulators. So this is a Rydberg atom 
uh, system, which I'll talk more about, uh, where atoms are prepared with optical tweezers or some other similar technique into arrays, uh, which are realizing the ground state of some system that could be described by a Hamiltonian similar to this. Uh, and I'll also not restrict myself to the ground state problem in a data-driven sense, uh, because with the advent of NISP devices, which John Preskill will talk about, uh, you know, these unitary evolutions that we're interested in can be broken down into circuits uh, where data is produced, you know, by reading the states of the individual qubits at the end of the circuit. So, you know, look forward to that in uh, one of the later talks. Okay, so again, the Hamiltonian driven setting is, I believe, the most familiar to most people. And this talk is about complexity of simulation, and, and it begs the question, you know, what makes Hamiltonian driven simulation hard, or where does the complexity lie? And uh, as a practitioner in this field, I think I've tried to boil it down to sort of three different examples of where we typically imagine difficulty or hardness lies, which, you know, could be exponential scaling of, of resources. And, you know, I think a, a paradigm that we're all familiar with in this field is that of entanglement entropy and the relation of entanglement entropy to algorithmic complexity. And again, I'm not talking about complexity in the sense of like Hamiltonian complexity. I'm really just using the word uh, more generally. Uh, so, you know, entanglement or specifically low entanglement, like area law entanglement, uh, occurs in, you know, ground states of local Hamiltonians. Uh, and it's really, we really consider it low entanglement. So, you know, simulation methods such as tensor networks or DMRG really, uh, you know, operate because of, of low entanglement in the typical, you know, ground state or, you know, low lying excited states that we're interested in, uh, in, in many applications. And, uh, you know, entanglement really gives us a way of sort of like thinking about the complexity and where it lies in a physical, uh, you know, I'd say physical paradigm. But I'd like to also point out that the density matrix renormalization group, which we heard about in Patrick's talk also, uh, you know, really was a heuristic algorithm. And I say that in a, in, in a good way, which was developed by Steve White and which later motivated sort of this way of thinking about, uh, you know, entanglement and its relationship to, to computational you know, hardness or complexity. And as mentioned also in the last talk, you know, uh, despite our understanding of the area law and so on, it's still a challenge to get tensor networks to work in higher dimensions. I'm a quantum Monte Carlo guy. Uh, you know, that's where the sign problem, uh, you know, reigns supreme. And it, it's just another way of thinking about complexity in some sense. A sign problem occurs because of the sign structure of a Hamiltonian or the relationship between the sign structure and a lattice of frustrated spins or a higher dimensional lattice of fermions. And, you know, that sign structure really, if it, you know, if it dictates uh, the, the sort of uh, form of a wave function or of, 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 um, of a path integral, uh, then it can really affect their ability to sample things stochastically. For example, a wave function can only be interpreted as a probability uh, if these amplitudes are real and positive, and that's connected uh, to the sign structure. So it's another source of complexity. And finally, optimization and ergodicity. I say ergodicity because even if I have a quantum Hamiltonian that doesn't have a sign problem, I could still, you know, have an, I, I could still suffer from uh, problems in ergodicity in a quantum Monte Carlo simulation. And kind of the analogy in the, the kind of parameterized version of tensor networks or VMC is an optimization problem that we really have to find a global minimum of. And these, you know, rough, you know, rough landscapes, if you want to think of them like that, that we encounter in these typical systems can be very difficult to solve, um, uh, you know, um, in sub-exponential time. So now let's turn to the data-driven setting. So I'm a theorist, so my quantum simulator, my quantum computer lives in a black box. And what I'm interested in is reading out the state and then possibly feeding back in designer control elements. And when I talk about quantum simulators, I'm really talking about highly, I guess, pure or highly controlled devices that can give me uh, projective measurements, you know, of the qubit states, uh, which are distributed according to some Born rule, you know, depending on what's inside the box. And this is my data. So when I talk about data-driven simulation, I'm really getting a bunch of, you know, uh, bit projective measurements, zeros and ones. There's n qubits in each one of these vectors. And I have some sort of data, uh, you know, size of my data set here, which is limited by things like your shot budget in your experiment. Like, you know, how long can you keep the thing coherent for? How many bases do you need, perhaps? And like, how much data can you realistically get? 
So my goal in, in the data-driven setting is to take this data, just as projective measurement, you know, these data vectors, and to learn a model of the underlying state that lives inside that black box. That model will be parameterized. And this is the important part of generative modeling, is I'm going to assign some parameters uh, to a wave function or a density matrix. And I'm going to hope that I can fit those parameters, which I've illustrated maybe in red here, this might be a, a parameterized distribution to a very limited data set. So if I cannot build the full you know, frequency distribution of that data, at least I hope that I can fit the parameters uh, of, of, the, of the generative model uh, so that you know, I can get a pretty good approximation to uh, you know, the underlying state. And the way you do this is through by maximizing the likelihood. You know, you're maximizing the likelihood of the existing data X drawn from P, which you don't have knowledge of, uh, to build this model. So once you have that red model, you know, you can basically treat it like a, you know, a variationally optimized wave function, except it wasn't variational, it was data driven, or some other, you know, on sorts wave function, which you've optimized the parameters uh, for, and you can use essentially at will. So I'll get back to that. So I call these generative models several times, and I want to talk about generative models, you know, which come from machine learning and which we're rapidly adopting into uh, sort of our, our to arsenal uh, in, in strongly correlated uh, systems. So I showed the maximum likelihood, which I'm, I'm emphasizing these things aren't trained variationally. They're not Hamiltonian driven, they're data driven. So when you have data, something like a maximum likelihood uh, uh, method underlies all of these models. There's two uh, big branches on this tree, this taxonomy tree, which you can find here. Uh, implicit density and explicit density models. Now, when I generated the deep fake of Dan Rovis, it was through a GAN. And most deep fakes you see on the internet will be generative adversarial networks. Uh, just very quickly, these are implicit density because uh, you don't have an explicit uh, parameterization of the, of the probability distribution. You have some sort of generator which produces a fake image and, and a discriminator which tries to distinguish real or fake, which then feeds back uh, and into uh, optimizing the parameters of the generator. But there's no explicit probability distribution inside of here. So they're very powerful, um, but I'm going to stick to the explicit density branch. And here's a good, um, I, I think, intuitive model for physicists on the explicit density branch. So here's a generative model uh, on the explicit density branch that I'll, I'm, I'm gonna label on, on another sub branch called approximate density. And, and that's essentially Hopfield networks or RBMs. So John Hopfield was the first to, I believe, you know, kind of adopt, let's call them Ising models. Um, John, I hope you're watching, uh, you know, for uh, this, um, this type of application. And Jeff Hinton and Yoshua, Bengio and others, you know, you know, adapted Hopfield's original idea to something that could be trained uh, and, and which is sort of has a variable expressivity. And those are restricted Bolson machines. So I've illustrated an RBM here, a very simple one, where I've distinguished visible and hidden uh, units or layers. Each one of these dots is an Ising variable or a, you know, a binary zero or one. And this thing describes a probability distribution, a joint distribution between the two layers through all of these parameters. So it looks like a neural network. All of these parameters, what I'm calling lambda, are just the weights, which are defined via an energy function here and give us a distribution uh, in, in, as a Boltzmann distribution, just in the usual way. So that's how you explicitly parameterize a probability distribution you know, within a neural network or a stochastic version of a neural network anyway. And it's an approximate density model because you basically don't know that partition function. So the thing's unnormalized. And if you want to estimate the density, uh, you know, you have to find some way of doing it via Markov chains or something like that. I also want to point out the last sub-branch here on my uh, tree, which is sort of the tractable density branch. And this is something new that as you know, Kenneth Matter physicists or uh, other physicists, you may not have encountered before, but tractable density models are very powerful models that are normalized. And, and many of these come from natural language processing. I've illustrated a recurrent neural network. So an RNN has a, a, an RNN cell in it with, with all sorts of parameters. Uh, but what this thing is, is it's sort of a, 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 a single unit, which is un, what they call unrolled uh, to uh, capture the length of a sequence 
Uh, there's a sequence of qubit states, se uh, time sequence. You know, this could be words that you're feeding into this thing. And so you can imagine uh, feeding in a qubit state. Uh, it outgoes in a hidden state. There's some probability that's output. You can sample the state of the next qubit in the chain and so on. Or it could be words in the dictionary that you're sampling. Uh, and these models are uh, very powerful and they're tractable because they're normalized. Okay, so I'm not really explaining it well, but the idea is that these things are normalized models that, uh, you know, you can produce exact samples from without anything like a, a Markov chain or so on that has autocorrelations in it. So, you know, transformers, GPT-3, if you look online, uh, you know, talk to transformer, you can really see how powerful these things are. And I believe in, in, in a very real sense that the autoregressive models, these things which are called autoregressive models, the tract tractable density kind, are really, you know, fruitful uh, sort of future area of exploration for generative models uh, in this field. <laughs> so how do we use generative models to learn quantum states? Okay, well, uh, there's various strategies, and I'm just going to point out uh, the simplest ones to me, because these are the ones that uh, Giacomo Torlai taught me over the last several years. So generative models for learning quantum states, I mean, as I, as I let you imagine, you know, I'm, I'm imagining a, a sort of quantum simulator that gives me nice, clean, projective measurements, or maybe some sort of generalized measurements of qubit states. Uh, but as you know, the probability distributions that come out of that are distributed according to Born rule. So they're not, you know, you're not getting sort of the full phase information. But you can capture the full phase information, number one, by uh, using uh, measurements in additional bases. Uh, and number two, by explicitly, and here I've done an explicit parameterization of an amplitude with a set of weights. Okay, so here's a wave function. Lambda is the weights associated with the amplitude and uh, mu are the weights associated with a phase. Okay, and so this is the original sort of uh, setting for RBMs for uh, quantum state reconstruction, uh, you know, as devised by uh, Torlai and Carleo and others a while ago. This can be generalized to other states that aren't pure. So if you have a density matrix, you know, you have a mixed state or you have some open quantum system uh, and you want to reconstruct that state, uh, you can also, you know, just use additional uh, parameters, you know, weights and biases, uh, which, which, you know, give you an explicit reconstruction. By the way, in these constructions, the parameters are all real. And so one thing I learned recently is that in neuromorphic circuits or spiking neural networks, uh, you know, these seem like very reasonable ways to encode uh, sort of state uh, reconstruction. Anyway, when you look at that, you probably see something that looks uh, like uh, quantum state tomography, if you're a quantum information person. Uh, and and you, you'd be right, this is very similar to quantum state tomography. You need an informationally complete uh, set of measurements in order to learn not only the uh, amplitude but and the phase um, in these cases. Uh, but there's also generative modeling strategies which are possible which don't require or you know don't rely on the full explicit state reconstruction and so i'm just pointing again out one of these that i'm a little bit familiar with uh and that, that's juan carasquia and leandro elita's uh idea uh for you know povm based formalism uh which i just kind of illustrated here without telling you what everything is um but here's a representation of a density matrix as a generative model, okay, that has that's completely real. There's no complex uh, weights or anything like that necessarily. Uh, but all of the entanglement structure of the density matrix, uh, you know, can be um, encapsulated by the generative model. While to put it simply, all the sign or phase structure uh, can be kind of encoded in this tensor network decomposition uh, in the POVM formalism. So one thing that's very powerful about this strategy is that it allows for the direct estimation of observables without you know, an explicit reconstruction of the density matrix. And, and I'll get back, uh, back to that. By the way, both of these uh, in, in our original paper here and, and uh, Stephanie Sizchek's paper, uh, these, both of these formalisms have been used to reconstruct real uh, you know, experimental data um, you know, in these two papers you know, from uh, uh, various uh, quantum states. So I wanna go through some examples and I'll, I'll do this fairly quickly. <clears throat> what you know where is this useful and how do we use it so the first example i want to go back to that original you know square picture of the rydberg atom um a quantum simulator that i showed in my data driven slide uh right at the start and just explore that a little bit further 
So here is a paper uh, collaboration between uh, Misha Lukin's group and Manuel Andres, uh, who are experimentalists, who produced these Rydberg atom simulators. And a Rydberg atom simulator is really uh, a, a, you know, a Hamiltonian here, which describes a two-state system uh, of, of rubidium atoms where each atom can be in its ground state or its Rydberg state, which is a highly excited state, okay? Uh, it looks, and it actually is a very kind of a generalized version of a transverse field Ising model with an off-diagonal operator here, uh, which, you know, is the Rabi frequency coupling of these two layers. There's a detuning, so if you detune slightly off frequency, uh, you kind of break the Z2 symmetry. And there's also, uh, you know, uh, which is in some sense the interesting part, uh, that strongly uh, strong interaction piece in these Rydberg atoms, so that if two Rydberg atoms are close to each other, they'll have some tendency to re repulse. So the experimentalists can prepare uh, a very sort of uh, rich phase diagrams. And in, within those phase diagrams, the, the simulation or the experiment can stop and give us projective measurement data. Here's you know, a dozen whatever uh, Rydberg atoms in a line, um, you know, uh, which can be sampled uh, you know, many different times, prepared and sampled. And uh, as a function of this detu detuning, their experimental system can go through a transition to a Z2 state where you have Rydberg ground state, Rydberg ground state, okay, so that the average occupation is, is a half up here. So this data, which I'm showing, uh, you know, uh, it, it is a black line, you know, it can also, you know, the simulator can also be checked via a, conven a conventional Hamiltonian driven simulation, uh, because it's a small enough one dimensional system size. Uh, you know, driven by this Hamiltonian, but we can also do a data-driven reconstruction in the blue. So what we've done is we've trained an RBM on 3,000 projective measurements per detuning parameter, and then reconstructed that diagonal observable. So that's kind of, in some sense, a difference between Hamiltonian and data-driven, but in that sense, you know, you can, in this case, you can ask, why do you need it? Well, on the right-hand side, I think I've shown what I believe is you know, the most important uh, sort of manifestation of this data-driven uh, uh, setting is that's when you don't have experimental data, for example, in the basis of some correlation function that you're interested in. So here I want to look at the expectation value of the off-diagonal piece. Well, again, I essentially have a, uh, a, you know, a variational wave function that I've trained from data. And by the way, it's sign-free because of this, this form of this Hamiltonian. And just like in other methods where you have a wave function, you can calculate off the angle observables. Uh, so here is the Hamiltonian driven simulation. And here's the data driven simulation trained from experimental data, you know, that I've obtained from this, um, um, uh, you know, experiment. Okay, so that, you know, and the discrepancy there, of course, is important. This either tells you that something's off in the experiment or different than the Hamiltonian, or it can tell you that uh, your, your generative model hasn't trained well. Of course, this is a one-dimensional system where Hamiltonian-driven uh, simulation is possible. But of course, what we're working towards uh, are both you know, hardware simulators and methods which uh, can deal with higher dimensional uh, uh, spin systems. So frustrated models in higher dimensions, for example. Uh, and here's an example of a uh, uh, you know, sign problematic model, a, a Heisenberg anti-ferromagnet, a spin one half model. And, uh, you know, we there's Hamiltonian simulation driven uh, data possible on uh, for a certain sizes of systems. And here's a 64, like an eight by eight uh, frustrated lattice. Um, and, you know, here's a correlation function. So this is something that is, you know, I think I believe very sensitive to the reconstruction. Uh, so this is the uh, two point function along the, the two lattice uh, primitive vectors here. And here's a data driven reconstruction using a generative model as laid out in this paper. Uh, so it's this POVM based construction. You have measurements in different bases, uh, and you know you can basically get really you know perfect correspondence between the data driven approach with generative models and the Hamiltonian driven approach. And of course, what we're waiting for is because you know this is the limit of Hamiltonian driven simulation. It gets complex because of various reasons. We're really waiting for uh, you know frustrated systems to be prepared on larger experiments so larger than we we can do Hamiltonian driven simulation for and then that data will become you know very valuable uh, for this type of data driven reconstruction. I also want to emphasize that as I mentioned this isn't just for ground states you know we can use 
generative models in various ways to predict dynamical quantities. Uh, so here is a collaboration, data from a collaboration with Rajabal Islam's Trapped Ion Lab at IQC at University of Waterloo, uh, where they're interested in, uh, you know, single ion readouts so they can prepare qubits uh, in these ytterbium ions, which, which uh, you know, they trap in some RF trap like this. Uh, and, you know, when they're trapped, uh, they're interested in how to read out, for example, different states and so on. And so here's Rabiflop data for a single ion. Okay, and this is a density matrix, uh, but it's, you know, the, it's, it's the, I'm calling it the zero, zero component. This is one real component of the density matrix. And what we've done is, uh, what, what Steph Sizcek has done, has taken a recurrent neural network, an RNN, and trained it on some portion of the data here. And then after the training is done, that RNN can be unrolled, if you will, in order to produce data, you know, further down uh, or, or for longer time periods, sort of down um, uh, in, in time. And so if you're, if you're someone who's working on, you know, readouts for quantum simulators or quantum computers, and you need to efficiently predict uh, essentially how, uh, you know, the readouts of single qubits look, uh, this type of data-driven reconstruction uh, which again matches very, this is one, one qubit, so we can also simulate it with Hamiltonian driven reconstructions. This type of data driven reconstruction, I believe, will be very important in experiments. And just to flash up one more application uh, along this line, um, uh, here's a paper um, um, by a group at Flatiron and uh, IBM that also showed the, uh, how this could be used in conjunction with near term devices. So they actually got real data on IBM's quantum computers. And on IBM, you can prepare a circuit, uh, you prepare some state, for example, perhaps you're trying to, like in, the, in Patrick's talk, you might be interested in preparing uh, in some sort of diatomic molecule or something like that. And then, you know, you can read out, uh, sorry, essentially uh, the data uh, of, you know, the, which gives you a distribution um, of, of, of projective measurements, which you can use to reconstruct estimators. But estimators done in this way with limited data can have large variance. Whereas we couple with a generative model, okay, that generative model, which may have some bias due to, uh, you know, imperfect training, can be sampled very rapidly to, to really reduce the, uh, uh, the variance. And they show here the probability of reaching what's called chemical accuracy in the energy uh, for several different diatomic molecules and show that, for example, quantum computing with neural networks, which is what this means, uh, can reach chemical accuracy with orders of magnitude less measurements, okay? And so this is very important for, uh, you know, this sort of feedback uh, um, portion of, of, the, of the loop where you read out a uh, quantum computer and you have to feedback, um, which I'll talk about. So we're entering a new era of data-driven simulation. You know, what's easy about it? What's hard about it? Um, things are slightly different, I, I'd say, in many ways than we think about uh, sort of the Hamiltonian driven setting. Uh, so first off, many of these generative models, many of these, many, many of these onsots like restrictive Boltzmann machines aren't constrained by area law entanglement, okay? But, uh, you know, they could learn area law entanglement, uh, you know, from data, certainly. Uh, the assumptions, uh, you know, that go into these architectures, which I haven't really talked about, are a form of inductive bias. And I think you have to be careful about which generative models you choose for which applications. So if you want good generalization, uh, you know, you have to keep that in mind. And, you know, I really think the frontier again, just to mention is these really interesting normalized models, uh, these autoaggressive models that are powerful and largely unexplored. So they all have, you know, the, the ability to capture entang lots of entanglement and so on. Um, there's an issue with data-driven discovery that you don't have in the Hamiltonian-driven concept context, which is, uh, you know, how much data do you need? Well, you know, it, here again, your inductive bias comes to play. So if you make assumptions on the sign structure, like I did for the Rydberg atoms, or you make assumptions on the purity, so you, you don't need a full density matrix, uh, you know, those assumptions come uh, to affect your sample complexity. Uh, but another thing I'd like to emphasize is, you know, if you're a state tomography person, you're thinking this is always exponential, but really it's not if, if uh, you can avoid, especially if you can avoid full state reconstruction, right? So you can use those inductive biases, or you can uh, come up with some of these methods, uh, like either pack learning um, or um, shadow tomography, which don't require full state reconstruction, okay? So all that is compatible with generative modeling. And, you know, the one thing that you you essentially always have to deal with 
is what does the optimization look like? Okay, so you have an expressive model, you have all the data. There's no guarantee that you'll be able to optimize the parameters, right? And this is the kind of crucial heuristic that goes into a lot of machine learning uh, methods that we don't often talk about. But you know, we use SGD, we use other methods. Um, you know, I, and I believe quant what I put in the second point, quantifying the relationship between optimization, like you know, quantifying whether or not um, you know the sign structure or the entanglement structure you know, get you stuck in local minima or things like that, gives you barren plateaus. That's really a central challenge that we need to address moving forward uh, for this data-driven simulation. And, you know, you certainly can't overlook the complexity of the optimization. So that's kind of the, I think, the three categories for, you know, complexity in the data-driven sense. I got one minute, perfect. Looking ahead, you know, very exciting things on the horizon. I think, you know, coupling generative models, like I showed, uh, out of the Flatiron IBM collaboration, uh, you know, with with circuits is really important for hybrid algorithms like the variational quantum eigensolvers QAOA, and this is one of the you know things we're pushing on in near term devices. And again, if you have a quantum circuit and you read out measurements and the the you know condition on those measurements, you're changing some parameters in the circuit. For example, you want that feedback loop to be as fast as possible. This is where generative modeling really comes in and cuts down the complexity of, of, of simulation. What I didn't get a chance to talk about was, you know, taking these generative models and training them in the Hamiltonian driven context. And I think it's a very rich field. Um, there's a lot of great work starting with uh, Carleo and Troyer's science paper in 2017. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just, a, again, a different setting, but a lot of really expressive, powerful models. In particular, again, these autoregressive models like RNNs or transformers. Uh, which are great architectures to explore. Um, if you look at Mohammed Hibet Allah and others' papers, you'll see RNNs coupled in ways that can be very, you know, be great. Uh, I'd say onsets wave functions um, for two-dimensional and higher-dimensional systems, and these do not suffer from some of the problems with, uh, you know, exponential complexity in the uh, optimization like PEPs do. So, if you're a tensor network person, I would totally encourage you to check out. Um, some of these new autoregressive models. I'll leave this slide up for my questions. You know, it's again, an exciting time. We have really beautiful data-driven, you, know, uh, you know, discovery in our hands with the advent of these highly controlled simulators. Um, you know, we'll be able to, you know, implement things like frustrated systems, you know, fermionic Hubbard models, and we'll be able to get clean data out of those things to train wave functions and to, and to esti uh, produce estimators and so on. These, these generative models that we've adopted from machine learning, uh, you know, I believe once they're coupled to NISC hardware, and again, stay tuned for uh, John Preskill's talk, uh, will sort of redefine what we think is hard, right? In, in the Hamiltonian driven setting, we have sign problems and all sorts of stuff. But these don't affect exper affect experiments. So if you can, you know, produce frustrated magnets and fermionic systems and produce clean data, this is all the simulators have to do is basically, you know, the the onsets wave functions can do the rest. And you know, I just like to thank everyone. Sorry I didn't get to give everyone a shout out who works on this stuff um, with me, but it's just really an incredible diverse uh, community of young people. Uh, I feel like the oldest, even if I'm not, who's doing this stuff. Uh, you know, it's gonna, it's great to see what you've done and I look forward to what everyone's gonna achieve in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Roger, very inspiring talk. I would like to encourage the audience to upload the questions uh, that are already asked. And we have a few minutes and I hope that everyone can stick around for the networking session for uh, more questions. I don't think they're gonna be able to get through all of them. The first question I have, the current winner is, that uh, the class of frustrated spin models is believed to be NP hard to solve in the general case. How do you expect to make progress here based on the data driven approach? Okay, so the Hamiltonian driven approach for solving a frustrated model, you know, you know in, okay, in general, uh, you know, there's a complexity class. Let's just let me just say that could be NP hard. But if I have an oracle, if you want to use that language, that gives me the ground state, okay. So I have an Oracle, which is the quantum computer, which gives me the ground state. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily NP hard to reconstruct estimators from that Oracle, uh, you know. And so I think that's the point. And I really avoided using 
the the language of complexity classes and so on because i think kind of may, maybe you maybe maybe this isn't the target audience but i believe that just you know because the hamiltonian complexity problem tells us something is np hard it's not necessarily true that reconstruction of estimators given the oracle is np hard so that's my answer great next question is um POVM, the positive operator valued measure, uh, why is it important? So the POVM formalism, again, it's a generalized measurement. It's, it has nothing to do with, um, okay, okay, so it's, you know, we, I've talked mostly about projective measurements, uh, you know, the kind of projective measurement setting. In the POVM formalism, I think what's important is you can write a de tensor network decomposition of the POVM matrices, which I didn't explain here, in an invertible way. Okay, so maybe that's technical and maybe I'm not explaining it well. I encourage you to ask Juan Carasquilla. Uh, but I think what this gives you access to is the ability to, again, you know, use um, the POVM formalism, if you will, or the decomposition to encode things like sign structures and phases. Well, the entanglement structures of all of the, all, all of the interacting variables can be kind of offloaded to a generative model, which is different, I think, than, than sort of these explicit state reconstructions. Um, so that wasn't a great answer, but somebody out there oh, knows. that's great. <laughs> we have, that's great. We have almost out of time, but very, uh, maybe, maybe very briefly, the last question, I'm gonna leave the rest for the uh, networking session. Is there any ro room for reinforcement learning techniques in the data-driven approach? Yeah, you know, I would love, I would have loved to talk about reinforcement learning. Um, it's certainly something that anytime you think about dynamics, uh, you, you could think about, but I really think the most important, and I don't have a, I, I really don't have a, a slide for it. I think one of the most important uh, roles for reinforcement learning may be in quantum error correction. Okay, so like when you have to predict, uh, you know, I guess error chains or recovery chains given syndromes and things like that. So, you know, look forward to next year's Cavalry session for that. Awesome. Thank you very much, Roger. I hope you uh, stick around for the networking session so we can continue uh, the discussions. Before we go to the next talk, I would like to very briefly share uh, one quick slide uh, with everyone. And um, here we are. First of all, I would like to welcome everyone to the APS March meeting 2021 on behalf of the Topco Group on Data Science. I would also uh, like to thank Professor Daniel Arovas for uh, engaging the GDS and myself uh, to organize this uh, great session and with our distinguished speakers. Um, we are, uh, I believe, the newest uh, topical group uh, at APS. We were founded uh, in April 2019. Uh, already, we are the largest topical group in APS with over 1,200 uh, members. I was honored to serve as the founding chair of this unit and uh, my current role as the past chair will come to an end this week. Um, some of the, uh, since we are new and this is basically our first real March meeting, which is uh, virtual, um, uh, we, I would like to just tell you very briefly, I have 30 seconds, maybe 45, uh, about what our mission is. Uh, we are here to build a community, so please join us. And um, if you are not a current member, you can use the code here displayed, GDSJOIN0321, uh, to get the first uh, year membership for free. Um, the other thing is among the uh, mission uh, that we are trying to accomplish is the resource sharing uh, within the community, uh, cross-discipline collaboration and training. Uh, we just had uh, our uh, 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 tutorial yesterday, first tutorial yesterday launch. And um, we've been doing a lot of webinars throughout uh, the pandemic and uh, we will continue doing that even after uh, and career preparation. Uh, so join us, join us uh, through APS. Also follow us on social media with the uh, handle APS Data Science. You can find us on, we have a YouTube channel. We have posted all of our uh, webinars there and uh, you can find us in any other social uh, platforms. Uh, listed here. Uh, just very quickly, here's a list of uh, invited sessions and tutorials that we have already scheduled for current March meeting. To see the full program, please uh, go to this short link, bit.ly mm2021-gds. Then I'm going to bring up the uh, next slide and I will let you to introduce our next distinguished speaker. Back to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. Uh, very exciting. The 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 new GDS. Uh, best of luck to uh, to you. And um, so, um, without further ado, our next speaker is uh, Michelle Gervin from University of Maryland College Park, uh, where she is a professor in the Department of Physics. Her research combines methods from statistical mechanics, dynamical systems, and graph theory to address interdisciplinary network-related problems in biological, social, and technological systems. She is interested both in broad theoretical approaches to complex networks, as well as specific applications, especially to information cascades, epidemiology, and genetic regulatory networks. Much of her recent work is aimed at the intersection of network science and machine learning. So Michelle, please share your slide deck. All righty. All right, I want to start by thanking the organizers for this great session. It's an honor to speak with the others in this session. Um, and I want to talk to you about opening the black box, combining knowledge free machine learning with knowledge based models. So what I want to think about here is time series prediction. Our main question is how can we predict the future of some complex time series based just on past history? And maybe we have a lot of data, maybe we only have a limited amount of data. And obviously there are a lot of applications for these kinds of problems. So weather prediction, climate forecasting, predicting stock market, social behavior, dynamics of living systems, and many more. Uh, one part that we focus on are hybrid approaches, combining artificial intelligence and machine learning with mathematical modeling, incorporating the laws of physics into some of our machine learning models. So before I get started, I just want to acknowledge uh, many people who have contributed to the projects that I'm going to talk about. There's a big team of graduate students uh, at the University of Maryland and other faculty that I've worked with on several of these projects. I want to particularly uh, recognize Professor Ed Ott and Brian Hunt. Uh, we've worked together on many of these studies applying machine learning to predicting complex time series. So what kinds of systems are hard to predict? The example that many of us think of is the weather, right? So weather is hard to predict, why? Because it's a chaotic system and it exhibits sensitivity to initial conditions. That means if I have two initial conditions that very close to each other, the trajectories diverge exponentially. So that's the so-called butterfly effect. And so in order to make good long-term forecasts, I need to specify the initial conditions extremely accurately. But of course, if I'm talking about atmospheric dynamics and all the variables that are involved, it's impossible to specify the initial conditions with that, with that much higher resolution. So I always have this prediction horizon that I'm fighting against. So this weather is this deterministic system that's hard to predict, but then on the other hand of things, we have stochastic systems, systems with randomness like stock market data, and those can also be hard to predict, but they are somewhat predictable, right? There are patterns in there. And so both of these deterministic systems with chaos or stochastic systems that are some kind of combination of regularity and randomness both of those can be hard to predict. And so what I wanna think about is how can machine learning help us forecast the future in these different types of contexts? So a little bit of background about artificial intelligence and machine learning. I know so many of you are familiar with it, but just to get the language uh, established for this talk. Obviously artificial intelligence is not new. It's you know been, growing and explored since the 50s. The goal is to have machines mimic human-like thought. The subfield of machine learning is all about pattern recognition, usually involving large amounts of data. 
Now, this newer trend of deep learning, which has driven many advances in image recognition, voice recognition, classification problems, is a subset of machine learning that uses a deep architecture of artificial neural networks. Um, and so it's from this multi-layer neural networks that you're able to do these big computations and Google can recognize your face very easily. And so what I want to talk about is a kind of machine learning that's a little bit parallel to deep learning. And that's this um, machine learning architecture called reservoir computing. It's an alternative type of artificial neural network. And it, it, we've seen that it's particularly good for time series prediction. So before I tell you about the work we've done on reservoir computing, let me tell you a little bit about deep learning so that we can contrast what a reservoir does um, with what's done typically in deep learning. So in deep learning, information is processed through these successive layers of neuron-like units. So I take an image, I feed it through these successive layers. And the early layers perform very simple calculations. So these neurons might fire if there's a dark pixel at a certain location in the image. And then the next layer is about combinations of what happened in the previous layer. So if some of these, some set of these previous neurons in the first layer fires, maybe one of these neurons in the second layer fires. So the deeper layers tend to perform more sophisticated information processing. So, you know, in these later layers, features like eyes, the dog might be identified. And it's these weights between the layers that are trained so that the input matches the desired output on my set of training data. So I have a bunch of images of dogs, I have a bunch of images of cats, fish, whatever. All these images are pre-classified. So when I put them through the network, the output for the ones that are dogs should say dog. Uh, and so on. And so these weights get trained through this gradient descent back propagation um, to to match the input to the output in the desired way. And then we can use it on new data and it performs really well. These types of deep learning are really great for classification tasks, but not as good for predicting time evolution. And one of the reasons is this is primary, this is a primarily a feed forward architecture. So the neurons in level two only get signals from the neurons in level one. So the arrows only go forward through these layers. Now you can add feedback loops. That's the recurrent neural networks that you heard about in the previous talk, but these make training the weights much harder and sometimes impossible. So reservoir computing was introduced in the early 2000s as a simple way to train recurrent neural networks. So we have a network of artificial neurons that is a little bit more brain-like because it has these loops, but at the same time, it's very easy to train. And the main component is this very high dimensional system called the reservoir. The reservoir provides a rich repository of dynamics. So with training, it offers a universal dynamical system. I can get it to mimic virtually any type of dynamics. And one of the key advantages is that it's amenable to simple hardware implementations. So a little bit about the pieces of reservoir computing. As I said, the main component is this reservoir, uh, which has neuron-like units. It has fixed random sparse connections and some internal firing dynamics. And I feed input into this reservoir. And so these reservoir neuron nodes have dynamics such that their state of a node at time t depends on the states of the inputs um, that you get from this input layer and also on the states of the other reservoir nodes that they're connected to. And But this connection, this adjacency matrix is just random. So the output is where we do the training. So we pull out a weighted combination of these reservoir dynamics in order to reconstruct um, this signal so that we want to be able to predict, we're feeding in U of T and we wanna be able to predict U of T plus Delta T. And we do this over all the training. And one 
nice thing about the reservoir is because it has these feedback loops, it has a long-term memory. So it can remember and contain within its dynamics some of the features of what happened a long time past. So the key advantage here to reiterate is that the training is really easy compared to deep architectures and very efficient because it's only these output weights that are adjusted. And then if we want to predict multiple time steps forward, what we do is we take this prediction at time t plus delta t and feed it back in as input. So in prediction mode, the output is fed back in as input and we can predict, we can do long-term forecasting in this way. So one question, you know, I'm saying, oh, we only train the output weights, everything else is fixed and random, but it has to be fixed and random in a kind of a sensible way. So how do we do that? And one important question that comes up is should the reservoir be critical? So this, come, this is related to a lessons, lessons from modeling neural networks. So if we model like real neural networks, we have an order parameter like the average firing rate, a tuning parameter, like something about the networks, the connectivity or the dynamical rules, I have a phase transition from quiescence to global firing. And it's at this critical point that the dynamical range is maximized. So the dynamical range is the range of stimuli that give me differentiable, interesting responses. So a response between virtually nothing and a saturated response. So we're, if we're very subcritical, we put in input and no matter what, not much happens. If we're super critical, we put in different inputs and almost always we get these large firing events. But near the critical point, we have maximum uh, differentiation in the input output relationship. And so we can use this idea in designing our reservoir computer such that the spectral radius of this adjacency matrix being near one gives good results. So that's what is corresponding to critical in these systems. But in fact, we don't actually need it to be that critical. Uh, so it's not that sensitive. We see robust performances over a wide range of values. Another important thing I want to note is that the reservoir doesn't have to be an artificial neural network. It can be some sort of complex system that gives us a complex repository of dynamics, is able to take inputs and provide outputs, and has some kind of internal memory. So there's this really cool study using a bucket of water as a reservoir where there's mechanical probes coding in these inputs and the outputs were looking at images on the surface, ripple patterns on the surface of the bucket of water and combining those patterns, those weights in order to construct the desired output. So on the other side of things, you know, Reservoir computing isn't the only type of machine learning architecture, obviously, that is good for time series predictions. Other machine learning architectures can also be used. Uh, common examples would be LSTMs or GRUs. So these are two types of recurrent neural networks and the recurrence is important to give some sort of long-term memory that helps in our time series prediction. So as long as we have an ML device with memory, we can train it such that we're predicting one step ahead. But the advantages of the reservoir computers is it's easier to train. And it often has lower training data requirements. And it might, and then in many cases, it could be easier to interpret the results because of its relative simplicity. So I'm gonna go over some examples applying reservoir computing for a prediction of spatiotemporal chaotic systems. So this is a pattern that involves in space and time, and the time evolution is is chaotic. Weather is a classic example of this, but I'm going to talk about a simple test system, the kuramoto savishinsky system, and it's designed to model the chaotic propagation of flames. So there's only one dimension of space that I'm plotting here on the vertical axis, and then your um, time is on the horizontal axis. And I can train a reservoir computer to predict this. Uh, so here on the top panel, you see the true state, 
the RC predicted state as a function of time, predictions start at time zero. In the bottom panel, you see the difference between the two. Green is good, that there's virtually no difference between them. And so you see that we obtain really high quality predictions for about five multiples of the Lyapunov time. So what that means is in that time, the distance between initially close trajectories is gonna grow by about a factor of 150, e to the fifth. Another thing that I really want to point out is notice that the true state and the RC predicted state have very similar qualities even after the predictions become unreliable. So I'm out in the 15 Lyapunov times. If I looked at the predictions, these are not good predictions. But the climate is right. All the statistical, all the ergodic properties are captured. And this is something different that we don't always see in other machine learning time series predictors. So some advantages of the RC is it seems to capture the climate better than other model-free methods. And it's quite simple to implement and not prone to spurious results. But of course, I just showed you this tiny little test system. What about predicting really large systems? I'm talking to you about motivating this by the weather, and I showed you this little tiny test system. So what we need is usually is a bigger and bigger reservoir in order to predict a bigger and bigger system. And that's not computationally feasible because the training time grows super linearly with the reservoir size, even though these are relatively easy to train compared to other methods. So the training time is gonna go super linearly with the system size, but how can we deal with this? So the answer is parallel reservoir computing. So this is in a PRL that our group put out a few years ago. Um, so we developed this architecture where each reservoir takes inputs from a spatially local neighborhood. So we have, as before, space on the vertical axis. So that we have these different sites and each reservoir predicts a subset of its neighborhood. And there's some crosstalk between locally close. So we get this feedback pattern where the output of this reservoir gets fed into as input to um, the neighboring spatial reservoir and so on. And the scheme we've shown is really effective for very, very large systems. So one challenge that some of my collaborators are undertaking is applying this to really forecasting the weather. And it's shown a lot of promise in doing that. All right, so I mentioned, well, you can do this with non-reservoir methods, time series, this being time series prediction. So we also had a recent paper, this was led by a group at ETH Zurich, another collaborator at MIT, and also involved our group at the University of Maryland, comparing reservoir computers to RNNs with backpropagation. And, you know, here is the valid prediction time. You see they all predict for similar amounts of time. In blue, we have the reservoirs. In green and red, we have the GRUs and LSTMs. The reservoir here, the largest reservoir is performing a little bit better, but the biggest difference that we see here is in the training time, the computational cost of training. In reservoirs, the, the reservoir computer requires markedly lower training time. So I also said sometimes the reservoirs require a lot less data. And, and while our group has been mostly focused on time series prediction, because actually I think that's where the reservoir performs best, we also played around with using reservoir computers for an image classification task. So this is a very simple task, classic machine learning task with a little bit of a twist. Um, we would... We, the task is that given two images of handwritten digits, determine if they're the same digit or different. So here's a similar case where it's two digits written by different people um, and they're both threes, that, would be, that should be marked as similar. This other one should be marked as different. Um, and this is on the MNIST training data set, the, M, the MNIST data set that's used for many machine learning algorithms uh, and we train the RC to recognize similar or different using training data images only for digits zero through five. And how do we feed this in? Well, we take these images and we cut them vertically into strips and we feed those strips as a time series. 
And then we train these output weights so that they point get the right output. We're not predicting a time step ahead, but rather we're classifying as similar or different. And we have two types of tests. We test the performance on new pairs, image pairs from the training class, the same digits, but just new pairs of images, or we test the performance on image pairs outside the training class. So in this case, it was digits six to nine, and we kind of compare the performance of reservoir computers with deep learning approaches. And I should say these are non-recurrent deep learning approaches, sort of uh, added, um, boxed approaches that we compared with. And so here were our basic results. If we have limited training data and we think about the scene classes, the digits that we trained on, but we're giving it new sets of those images, the reservoir computing and the deep learning approaches, they both perform pretty well. Um, and this table is showing you the fraction correct. The training size was 500 image pairs. The testing size was also 500 image pairs. And what's not shown here is that the distance, the deep learning outperforms reservoir computing if you give it more data. And if you give it more data, the reservoir does a little bit better, but that's where the deep learning uh, really shines. But what we were interested in was this problem of generalization uh, to unseen classes. We never gave, gave it digits six to nine, and yet the reservoirs were doing better at generalizing the concept of similarity to unseen classes. So this was you know, sort of a side study thinking about, okay, well, what kind of flexibility does the reservoir computer have in terms of applying it to image classification problems, given that we've had a lot of experience applying it to time series problems? All right, so, so far what I've talked about has all been this knowledge-free machine learning. I'm just trying to find patterns in the data. I don't have any notions about what those patterns should be. So how do we incorporate knowledge or physics into machine learning models and how much does it help? So why do we incorporate knowledge first of all so if we have some knowledge about the physics of the system that can ease the burden of machine learning so maybe i need a lot less training data if i'm not asking the machine learning algorithm to relearn all the laws of physics um, and in fact i said all this time that so far i've done knowledge free methods and that's not exactly true in fact the parallel scheme that i described to you was an example of incorporating spatial knowledge to improve this machine learning performance, right? Because I had this system where I had these sites that were arranged in space and I had a belief that um, one, the dynamics at one site were most strongly influenced by the, the dynamics at spatially local sites. Uh, and so we were able to incorporate that into an architecture that then allowed us to make the problem much more scalable. On the other side of things, we often have a mathematical model and that's usually imperfect of the dynamics. So how can we combine this with a knowledge-free reservoir computing approach? So we explored this hybrid architecture in a paper from a few years back, where basically we have this time series input and it's fed both into the reservoir and into this alternate model or this knowledge-based model. Uh, and then output from the alternate model goes in, into the reservoir. So the reservoir gets some information about the alternate model prediction and also is fed into the output layer. So we can train these weights to say, okay, well, this model is doing pretty well, um, or the reservoir can sort of serve as a correction to the model. And as before, weights in the output layer are trained to maximize prediction in the training data set. So uh, here's an example of how this performed for this simple uh, test case, this KS system. And in this case, our imperfect model that we gave it was the same dynamical equation, but with one of the terms having a parameter mismatch. So it was a low error. This was really a pretty good model of this system. 
But we see even that pretty good model, this system, it's only predicting for about two Lyapunov times. And we picked a large reservoir that was also predicting for about two Lyapunov times. And not surprisingly, the hybrid method does better, but what is surprising is by how much it does better. Uh, so there is actually this big effect of strong improvements. And what's even more surprising than that was that if we take a pretty bad model and a small reservoir and each of those can only predict for, for a very short amount of time in terms of giving quality predictions, the combination of the two really offer surprising prediction results. All right. Okay. So if we think about this hybrid architecture, we can use it not only with an imperfect knowledge-based model, the alternate model, and I could have different alternate models, could be mathematical models or other data-driven approaches. Um, for example, other machine learning models, right? So I can have this alternate model be a deep learning model. And one thing about the hybrid architecture is that it can help us reveal the strengths and weaknesses of alternate models, hopefully leading to improvements on both sides. So the idea here is that I can do a systematic scientific study of coupling these different models with the reservoir and seeing, well, which, which perform better? What kinds of corrections does the reservoir make? Um, and how do, what do these output weights that that my system has learned look like in terms of weighting different, different mathematical models if I put several of them together. Uh, one other advantage of this kind of framework is that I can have my alternate model. Let's say we know that a deep learning approach, especially a deep learning with recurrence, takes a long time to train. So I can have this alternate model be this model that I trained for a long time on lots of data, but now I have new data that looks a little different. I don't have that much of it. And so maybe that's where I start coupling it with a reservoir. If I'm looking at non-stationary dynamics where I have a very high quality deep model, deep learning model that I think should be good, but might need some corrections that I need to do quickly. All right, and I just wanted to point out some other recent work by our group. We've been thinking about applying reservoir computing and also just thinking about this problem in general, not just for reservoir computing, but machine learning more generally. Um, so uh, we had a paper, this one's a little while ago, on using machine learning to repl replicate chaotic attractors and calculate Lyapunov exponents from data. So this sort of focuses on this question of climate replication, where we really are able to use machine learning to faithfully replicate the dynamical system and, and reproduce all those um, ergodic properties. Uh, another paper we, that came out recently was on separation of chaotic signals by reservoir computing. Uh, still another in terms of combining uh, knowledge-based models with this idea of parallel reservoir computing. Uh, sounds like a straightforward thing, but there were actually several subtleties in, in making that work. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we're, we're interested in these non-stationary processes, and we have a paper in Press and Chaos now, which is really all about predicting non-stationary dynamical processes and predicting phase transitions or regime changes before you've ever seen the phase transition. So that's an interesting paper. And then finally, on this horizon of combining reservoir computing with deep learning methods, this is a preprint about hybrid back propagation and parallel reservoir networks. And I think that's kind of the horizon of what's happening next. So I wanted to give a shout out. This is a very incomplete sampling of related work on reservoir computers. So in the last several years, obviously our group has been really interested in this, but there's been a lot of other groups studying reservoir computing largely be, or partly because of their utility in physical reservoir computing. 
Um, so some recent papers in photonic reservoir computing, rapid time series prediction using hardware-based reservoir computer using FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, uh, and a review of physical reservoir computing. And then others working on foundations and horizons in reservoir computing, this problem of learning chaotic attractors with applications to cryptography. Uh, here's another paper about network structure effects. So this reservoir that I said is just random and fixed, but obviously how I choose that randomness, whether it's critical, other properties could be important. And so here's a paper that studies this. So that's something that we all have to sort of grapple with, this idea of how do I tune these hyperparameters that I just say are random and fixed? What are the good choices of those? Um, there's also applying this to quantum information, so quantum reservoir processing, and another recent paper on, the, on explaining the surprising success of reservoir computing. So just to summarize, uh, reservoir computing, it provides this promising method for predicting complex time series because it offers this universal dynamical system that can be easily trained. And this parallel reservoir computing makes prediction of very large systems feasible. That's allowed us to incorporate the spatial part of the physics on a very low kind of zeroth order approximation. But the hybrid scheme allows us to put physics in more carefully. And so we can couple alternative forecasting with reservoir computing, offering these dramatic improvements in some cases. And so this approach can let us explore the strengths and weaknesses of both the machine learning side of things and alternate models and hopefully lead to better mathematical models and better machine learning systems. And so the direction where I see uh, there are a lot of things about to happen are this this combination leveraging both the advantages of reservoir computing and the advantages of other more traditional machine learning approaches. So with that, I'll end. Thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure to be here. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle. We have a number of questions. Um, let's get right to them. Um, first one, please uh, audience, please upvote uh, the questions as you, uh, as you see fit. Is there a comparison between reservoir and transformer? Uh, yes, so you can have reservoir computers that have a transformer aspect to them. Uh, so there are going to be kind of coupled, there's been some studies coupling those types of architectures. Thank you. Uh, do you understand why the reservoir computing approach works for five Lyapunov times? Please explain. Ah, so five Lyapunov times, it's a long time, but it's still the horizon of predictability. I mean, it's, it, it's still um, an amount of time where if we specify our initial conditions within our machine position, we can predict out that length of time. So it's not, um, it's, it's not an impossible time. And the reason it works is because of the synchronization between the true dynamical system and the reservoir. So there's what's called generalized synchronization. As we feed in this dynamical system, the activity of the reservoir is going to get synchronized to that system. And then what we have is when we close the loop, we're able to predict those dynamics faithfully afterwards. And so the way I like to think about it is we've really done a good job faithfully representing the true dynamics with the reservoir system. Um, what is the essential difference between RC and other methods? So the essential difference between RC and other methods is the lack of back, back propagation. So I'm just training this one layer and that makes it much easier to train. That what's happening within the artificial neural networks, the connections between the, the, the neurons, they, those don't get trained. And that's what gets trained in other deep learning methods. And because we don't do that, we just train how we pull out the activities of the different reservoirs and weight them in a combination to produce the output that we desire. Makes it much simpler. Great question. Um, 
can uh, can reservoir computing describe dissipative dynamics? Yes, yes, reservoir computing can describe dissipative dynamics. Uh, so this kind of uh, brings up a question. So what kind of dynamics is it going to be easier for the reservoir to capture? And what kind of dynamics is it harder? And so I think this, you know, so we're often testing this on chaotic dynamical systems. And that's actually where the reservoir really shines. Uh, but it also can uh, do these other dynamical systems um, where there is a lot of determinism and regularity in them, but because it doesn't have as much regularity as in the chaotic dynamical systems, uh, any types of dynamics that that move away from that are going to be a little harder for the reservoir to do well at. For the MNIST classification problem, can RC deal with rotated digit images? Ah. So we didn't train on that. Um, we actually trained on a task. So I, I showed you this simple, when I described it, I described it, it wants to decide if this image pair is the same or not. Uh, so we didn't test if it can deal with the rotation, but we did try to train it to learn a 90 degree rotation. And we found that the RCs learned that 90 degree rotation really well and was they were able to apply it to the unseen classes, the other digits, whereas the deep learning methods didn't do so well. And I should say these are off the shelf deep learning methods. You know, we didn't, you know, try to, to tune it so that, you know, it's the best possible deep learning method out there. So perhaps others could certain kinds of methods, but the typical methods really were not doing as well. All right, I'm gonna use my prerogative to ask the last question, which is, um, do you have any uh, prediction for, for when these deep learning methods will, will uh, hit prime time in application to meteorology? Uh, well, my collaborators have a paper out on this. So, you know, I, meteorology is a great problem for this because we have these great weather, um, weather models, which incorporate the models of physics, but there's also this data-driven aspect that we want, that we have this data assimilation problem where we want to update the state based on the new information that's come in. And so one of my collaborators that I put on at the early slide, um, Istvan is a professor at Texas A&M in atmospheric sciences, and he and Ed Odd and Brian Hunt and some and some others have been working on this problem and have some new models for this. Um, and so I think very soon, actually. All right. Thanks very much. We're going to have to move on. I hope you'll stick around for the uh, post-session networking. There are many questions that are, uh, are archived for you there. Um, and now uh, I'll turn it back over to uh, Mohammed to introduce our next speaker. Great, thank you, Dan. And this is my great honor to introduce our new speaker, Professor Una Kim from Cornell University. Una Kim's research interests lie in the theoretical study of the collective phenomena which uh, condensed matter systems exhibit and in under understanding how much uh, phenomena, how such phenomena emerge from microscopic physics, especially in a strongly correlated systems. Some specific areas of focus include unconventional superconductivity, topological phases, and application of machine learning to quantum matter data. These are complex and challenging problems that require a variety of theoretical approaches. Una, please share your screen, take it away. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Great. Well, um, thank you for the introduction and thank you so much for the invitation. It's a great honor. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank um, Dan, our fearless leader, um, getting us through this whole um, pandemic situation, what happened last year, uh, the canceled March meeting and so on. We are all really grateful to you. So um, I want to talk about machine learning of quantum emergence. 
And um, you can find more details in these references. Uh, when studying quantum emergence, we seek simple theoretical insights from complex experimental data, such as STM uh, or X-ray. And we, val we want to validate our understanding by trying to make predictions. This, um, in the ideal world, we would always be doing this uh, walk, going through this two-way street, but um, this becomes challenging due to the large phase space of information in quantum matter. Um, here I'm showing cadmium renate. Um, in a perfect ideal world of a perfect crystal, if you only care about the structure, the information content is intensive. But once you take distortions, fluctuations, and moreover, electronic degrees of freedom into account, the information contents of um, a, a piece of material can quickly exceed information content of uh, the Library of Congress. Um, explicitly or um, implicitly knowing this, the community have for a long time um, pursued trying to get more and more information out of our systems. And this successful pursuit brought us to data revolution. Uh, in 1960s, when you have a macroscopic tunnel junction like this, the data consisted of a single curve. And we, those in the uh, community of superconductivity research, know and love this curve. We know why the density of states suppressed. We know why there is a sharp peak. But moreover, we also know why there are these wiggles. These little wiggles were validation of BCS theory of superconductivity. But fast forward, come to today's uh, study of tunneling, we use a uh, vacuum as tunnel junction and make measurements in subatomic scale precision. Instead of one curve, we have tens, hundreds of thousands of curves. And you can open up uh, condensed matter solid state textbooks and they won't tell you how you can connect this beautiful complex data to some theoretical insight. X-ray diffraction um, in early days, uh, Bragg and Bragg's Nobel Prize winning paper explained three peaks. This very first successful forward model that explained these three peaks is what is now taught in introductory physics as the Bragg condition. Fast forward to today, the uh, X-ray diffraction data today look like this, 100,000 peaks and uh, we don't know what to do with this volume of data. Projected measurement in early days of quantum mechanics, um, Stern and Gerlach uh, was proving the Hilbert space of single spin, two-dimensional Hilbert space. Today, we prove exponentially larger Hilbert space with uh, tools such as quantum gas microscopy, or uh, snapshots of Rydberg atom array, uh, Roger talked about. And once again, um, how can we make use of this information? Now, in facing these challenges, it's useful to remember we're not the only community trying to understand data and try to make predictions using models. The machine learning community, data science community, uh, try to understand complex data, and that's called regression. They try to model what can happen in the future. That's called generative modeling. So the quest uh, is, can we make use of machine learning tools uh, such as uh, neural networks and use their expressive power to model, be a universal function approximator or use probabilistic modeling to uh, do generative modeling. So in my group, for the last couple of years, we've been pursuing uh, this goal, exploring different types of data and different types of approaches. We've looked at scanning tunneling spectroscopy, resonant ultrasound spectroscopy. Um, we've also been working with uh, data from IBM Q, um, simulated uh, quantum uh, critical point and uh, X-ray data and quantum gas microscopy data. And you can find more details from these contributed talks, which I um, would like to encourage you to attend. 
in the rest of my talk today, I'm going to show some highlights. Um, but before I get into the highlights, I do want to share the lessons that we've learned. The, probably the most important lesson in my mind is that uh, choice of tools, because these are tools, choice of tools should be driven by the, the task at hand. So this Power Blender is a wonderful tool if you are trying to make a smoothie. But if you are interested in making guacamole, this simpler looking tool can be your best friend because it allows you to see how different ingredients come together and blend. And that's exactly what uh, physicists like to know. We like to know how things happen, why they happen. So in trying to uh, bring back the insight that we gained from machine learning to progress in physics, we found it to be most often most productive to try to find minimalistic approaches and try to integrate um, key physics principles. So um, let me start with supervised machine learning for hypothesis testing on quantum image-like data. So back to STM, the question is, how can we connect this beautiful and complex data to um, some insight? And we tackle this question in this paper that was led by my, uh, spearheaded by my former postdoc, Frank Yi Zhang, in collaboration with uh, my close collaborator, um, Seamus Davis. So this is what uh, the enigm enigmatic, infamous um, pseudo gap state looks like when you look at it using scanning tunneling spectroscopy. A long-standing question in the community it has been, uh, what is the best way to describe this uh, pseudo gap state? Should we start from uh, momentum space, free fermions, uh, and, and approach it from the weak coupling perspective and think about nesting driven modulations? Or should we start from strong coupling uh, approach of um, thinking about localized electrons forming spin moments and how those get frustrated by doping of holes? Now, when looking at data like this, which obviously is showing some signs of modulation, the first thing that we uh, think of is Fourier transform. But Fourier transform of uh, this data set, as is clear from this line cut, is very noisy and broad because there are a lot of um, sharp real space features. However, when you look at this uh, data, our eyes that are very good at picking up motifs clearly see that there are some motifs. So can we pull that out? And the approach we took was to think of this problem like a handwritten digit recognition problem. One can train neural network with um, uh, digit, um, bitmap digit handwrite, handwriting and um, train it to recognize it as the right number. Can we train neural network to recognize different hypothesis and um, see in the experimental data, which one is closest. So this effort starts with uh, the training set generation because we have big complex data, but we don't have abundance of equivalent data. So the, uh, we started with um, training the neural network with simulated data that uh, mimics the uh, amplitude and phase fluctuation of modulations as well as topological defects. And our different options that's equivalent of number choices are um, different modulation frequencies, uh, periodicities, and um, category two with period four being the only commensurate or real space-based um, model. The outcome, when once we gave the uh, experimental data to the trained neural network was uh, very striking. When the free transform hardly shows discernible features, this is looking at one sample at different energies. And um, this column is the free transform. When you look at the neural network outcomes, at once the energy scale reached the pseudo gap energy scale about 96 millivolts here, 
the uh, the outcomes that were sort of neck to neck at lower energy scale start to really differentiate. And what's really showing up as a winner is uh, looking at one direction, X versus Y, um, for the uh, hypothesis of uh, commensurate period four. Now, looking at these outcomes as a function of energy, it becomes very clear the category two associated with period four really becomes a robust winner at pseudo gap energy scale. We then repeated this analysis uh, through the entire data set that it's been collected for about a decade over different doping. And repeatedly we find, and in the underdope uh, systems, the uh, period four category two is coming out to be the overwhelming choice until we reach the um, optimal doping. So based on this uh, extensive analysis, um, utilizing the neural network, we concluded between these two hypotheses, the momentum space, uh, the uh, weak coupling driven um, incommensurate charge density wave versus strong coupling driven commensurate charge density wave, um, the S STM, the pseudo gap state as seen by STM is best described by unidirectional lattice commensurate period four charge modulations. Now this was an exciting um, outcome, but one thing that we uh, did not manage to answer at this time was the question of interpretability. What did the neural network actually learn? Although the neural network we used was very simple, it was still a black box. Now we've recently turned to this question of wanting to have interpretable um, architecture for image-like data. And this, col this collaboration was really uh, spearheaded by my student, Cole Miles. Um, and we've had a, a pleasure of collaborating with um, my colleagues in computer science as well as uh, Harvard group. So now we are back to the projective measurements of today. And um, my collaborators and I are really convinced that, especially for uh, projective measurements, it's really important that um, we can interpret because we are looking at uh, these samplings of uh, that is sampled from two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. And we're trying to answer uh, a mysterious regime of hard problems like Fermi Hubbard model. So where do we start when we want, when we want to interpret uh, learning of the neural network? If you look at a uh, convolutional neural network, which is a very successful uh, architecture for image recognition, a given layer consists of uh, taking the image data and convoluting with a filter to form a convolution map and then put it through nonlinearity. This nonlinearity is the step. This, it's this step that is responsible for expressibility of these neural networks, but it is also this step that may turn them into black boxes because nonlinear functions are hard to interpret. So um, our um, key insight in developing correlation CNN or um, CCNN, uh, we describe in this, this preprint, was to tame this nonlinearity. We want to have nonlinearity because we need to be able, uh, we need expressibility, but we want to have it on our terms. So um, we introduced taking the convolution map and just uh, looking at higher powers of them and collecting them all as a part of input. This allows us to have nonlinearity, but we turn it on as much as we like, as, as much as we find necessary. And uh, it allows us to go back and take a look. So then we um, trained the CCNN with uh, simulated data uh, associated with two types of hypothesis, uh, geometric string and pi flux theory, both starting from uh, uh, half filling or uh, one electron per site state of antiferromagnetically ordered state and considering what, what 
uh, happens when you try to dope pull. In geometric string, the dope pull moves, leaving a wake of um, wrong bonds behind. Pi flux theory consists of a uh, superposition of singlets. Now, once CCNN is trained, that's where all the fun begins. We fix the learned filters, and then we can figure out what is it that um, this trained CCNN learned using regularization path analysis. So for regularization path analysis, what we do is to fix the learned filters. These were two filters we learned, um, which was uh, really uh, firing for the, which was relevant for the uh, uh, geometric string versus pi flux. But it's hard to tell by looking at the filters why these, these this filter or that filter meant what to the neural network. So what we then do is retrain the final layer under this new loss function with this um, lambda. When lambda is large, it penalize, penalizes having making use of any input. So by um, tuning down lambda, we let the neural network you start to use input, and it will start by using the most informative input. And that way, we figure out what are the um, input that was most informative after having gone through convolutions and uh, looking at the higher powers. And what is clear in this path analysis is that the fourth order correlators are most important. Once they are turned on, accuracy jumps right up. So then the remaining task is to figure out what, what does the fourth order correlator mean? The fourth order correlator of each of these filters uh, means to look at four pixels together. So we choose four pixels from the three channels, spin up, spin down, and hole, and figure out the motifs that um, come out of them, and then see whether that makes sense to us. Now, starting with this filter that was associated with geometric string, when we go through that exercise, the exercise that I just described of collecting four pixels, we come up with these uh, sets of motifs. And then we stare at it. That's where it comes back to human. We stare at it and we realize, oh, you know what? That makes sense. Because we would have a motif like this in the wake. We would have a motif like this when um, the four side uh, filter uh, it, foresight includes, because it's a uh, fourth order correlator, includes a whole. So this is a moment that's kind of like um, you worked hard preparing for the lecture and you've delivered pouring your heart out and you ask the student this prodding question at the end of the lecture and the student answers it correctly. And it's that rewarding moment that you feel like, gosh, I managed to teach something. So. Um, this is what we've been able to do with CCNN. And because we designed the architecture to be versatile, we are very optimistic that uh, this can be applied to uh, different types of image-like data, um, including snapshots of Rydberg um, array and other uh, image-like data. Now, in the remaining time, I want to uh, switch gears and talk about unsupervised machine learning for large volume um, X-ray data analysis. This was uh, all of the uh, three projects that I am discussing today. Um, by far, was the uh, the largest scale and was most challenging. It really required uh, three different uh, types of you know people coming with different backgrounds: uh, theoretical physicists and computer scientists and um, experimentalists working with uh, at, at um, synchrotron facility to learn to talk to each other and to, to learn to think together. Um, we have many senior um, colleagues involved here, but it wouldn't have happened without, uh, if it wasn't for these young, brave, energetic people, especially my former so student, Jordan Vendley, we're all indebted to uh, his grit, never giving up and um, coming up with really creative solutions. So um, what can we hope to learn from X-ray data? Here I, I am giving a cartoon picture of a 1D system. So a, if a perfect uh, undistorted 1D crystal looks like this in real space, 
X-ray data will look like this. There are breadth, breadth peaks, uh, different heights um, reflect the form factor or the structure inside the unit cell. Charge density wave, which uh, in this case uh, depicted has double the unit cell size, will introduce super lattice peaks. Intra-unit cell order, which does not change the unit cell size, does not introduce new peaks. However, it will change the form factor in a subtle way. So you can imagine this can be harder to detect. Now, even harder is to uh, figure out the uh, fluctuations, which are reflected in the diffuse intensities. With this 1D system, now that I have explained it all, you can look at the data and try to reconstruct what's going on in, in, the, in uh, the real space. That's what we would like to figure out, like Bragg and Bragg did. However, the challenge is the, that the real data that we're interested in lies in three-dimensional space, and moreover, it's the volume. We've got so much information, and we have this um, embarrassment of the riches. Um, during the pandemic, as a, as a parent of young kids, um, I faced a different type of volume-driven problem. I was frequently asked to search for the special piece. And um, early in the spring last year, we, we figured out that um, picking up one piece at a time, going through a manual search is a bad idea. We cannot stay focused as we pick through um, all the pieces. So then what's the alternative? The alternative is to sort, for instance, sort by color. Once you have sorted, you can focus on that bin that is relevant. And then um, you can sort further from there, now maybe based on shape. So now coming back to the x-ray problem, with the Lego pieces, the sorting criteria was obvious. Um, and perhaps we could use the same criteria repeatedly. But with the X-ray data, we can anticipate for each system, what is a meaningful criteria could be different. So can we come up with a strategy to learn the meaningful criteria each time and use it to sort and discover thereby? Um, our approach, X-Tech, uh, X-ray temperature clustering was born when we decided to make use of the simple uh, formula that we all know, that is that system minimizes free energy and therefore balances uh, Hamiltonian with, against entropy controlled by temperature. So the idea is to keep track of the temperature evolution of intensity at every point in the reciprocal space where we have data, humanly impossible, but um, totally possible with machines. And then uh, we learn different qualitative temperature dependencies to reflect uh, different types of physics that's going on in the system. So um, first thing to do is to look at what the uh, temperature dependencies actually look like, and it looks like this mess. The next thing came was what would be a good strategy in sorting this through and learning the trends that's in this data. And uh, we decided to use uh, a simple approach, a sort of a simple version of speaker verific verification, Gaussian mixture model. And we made use of uh, label smoothing used in uh, a computer vision problem in this case, in the picture, to um, incorporate zone to zone correlations and uh, nearby momenta correlations. Um, and the multivariate normal distribution is the model. And we find the uh, hyperparameters that are the means and variances, as well as the weight by uh, maximizing the expectation. So when that is all done, our mess of the data becomes something like this. And now it's clear from this learned mean that there is a phase transition and there is a hope of finding the order parameter. So let's put it to work. Uh, Paracolor metal, uh, cadmium renate, uh, has this uh, paracolor structure, um, interpenetrating network of cadmium and rhenium. It is a system that goes through a, a series of subtle 
intrauterine cell transitions before it enters a superconducting phase. At this transition between phase one, uh, cubic phase, and phase two at 200 degree, there's a huge uh, signal in specific heat. However, the distortions uh, measured by x-ray are just tiny. They're, they're just very subtle and very small. Uh, the disparity between the two uh, led people to question, perhaps it's the 5D electrons in rhenium playing an uh, important role leading to this large signal and specific heat. Recent measurements, uh, optical measurement by uh, David Shee's group have also um, raised a question about the nature of the order parameter. While it's been uh, mostly thought the order parameter of phase two is known, this experiment raised a question of whether it is actually the two-dimensional EU representation or one-dimensional T2U representation. If one could detect goldstone mode fluctuation associated with two-dimensional EU representation spanned by I4122 and I4 bar M2, that would be a, a quite convincing smoking gun signal of uh, the order parameter. But such um, investigation would require being able to keep track of Bragg peaks as well as diffuse scattering, which is not possible in conventional way. So, um, my, co my colleagues at uh, Argo National Lab acquired eight terabytes of data, third of um, Library of Congress. We feed it to XTEC and wait for 10 minutes. And this is what we get. This is showing this, uh, this cluster result of trajectories is showing that there are two different types of behavior. Um, although they uh, are, are looking very similar near TC. So clearly there is a single uh, critical exponent, but there are two different behaviors. And how do we interpret this? How do we know this is right? When we just look at where these uh, trajectories clusters came from in reciprocal space, what's emerging is, now this is so regularly as if I've done it by hand, but this is really the, uh, the data. What's emerging is the selection rule. There are these points that are described by uh, this set of HKL indices, for instance, 0, 0, minus 6, we'll belong here, and then there are the rest. And these uh, points like 0, 0, minus 6 is showing a clear suppression of intensity deep in the ordered phase. And this is as far as x can go. It got us to this point in 10 minutes, and that's where um, our fund begins. The problem comes back to the human researcher report. And uh, we look at this and say, oh, these points, I know how to model the structure factor for these points. Those involve um, sines functions of the Z displacements of rhenium and cadmiums. For the sine function to be, uh, some of sines to be suppressed, delta Z of rhenium and delta Z of cadmium better be in the opposite direction and about the same magnitude. So comes our uh, modeling, understanding of the structure. This is, this is fitted to the data. And this is a surprise because um, until now, rhenium's were expected to be hardly budging. DFC calculations find rhenium's to be hardly moving at all because they have perfectly satisfactory bonds. So this indicates the D electrons in rhenium's are active, um, causing there to be stronger bonds forming a string and uh, supporting ideas such as spindematic. How about the fluctuations that I talked about? So look, to look at fluctuations, now we opened up each Bragg peak and look at the diffuse regions as well as the, the centers of the peak, which dominates the signal when we average over the peak region. And then we found there are actually three different clusters. The centers of the peak uh, clusters into one group. Now this is in log scale because of the large disparity in the, uh, in the, in the magnitude. But the diffuse regions are showing once again, two different clusters. So mapping them back out in the reciprocal space, what you find is the diffuse regions color showing same sort of selection rule. Um, except that now what used to be yellow, the 
uh, suppressed regions are showing larger um, diffuse scattering. So what is going on? Now we will open it up and uh, open it up and check the raw data. And it's true, this wasn't made up. This is indeed in this uh, red diffuse region, there is a whole extended range of temperature throughout the phase two. There is a lot of uh, uh, diffuse activity. And this is where, again, the question comes back to the human researcher. We look at this and think that, hmm, so how do we think about this diffuse trajectory? Well, um, this diffuse trajectory of the red region and the blue region, we can try to model it. So we model it with Landau theory, and we find that this whole extended region of diffuse intensity has to be the Goldstone mode because just the critical scattering uh, really only dominates this uh, critical region. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, maybe we have like 20 more seconds left. Okay, I'm almost done. So um, this confirms that uh, we have discovered the Goldstone mode. So I've talked about um, gaining new insights from complex data and accelerating discovery. And one time I talked about accelerating discovery and one of my colleagues, a uh, colleague in the audience said, well, that's just automation. So here is an example of automation, um, Jacquard Loom, when most people thought it was just automation, um, Ada Lovelace saw the potential of programming a computer with it, which we know is how we program the early computers, the punch cards. So um, the machines are coming or they're already here and um, it's up to us to choose to, lear to learn them, to use them and to adopt them and use them for the scientific progress. And um, I wanna end the talk in case you're inspired in advertisement for the summer school where we are accepting applications where uh, we'll be discussing the application of uh, quantum uh, of machine learning to quantum matter data. And there will be hands-on session with um, computer scientists and data scientists teaching um, basic tools uh, and ha having uh, students having opportunity to learn through practices. So um, on that note, I will end here and thank you for your attention and this opportunity. Thank you very much for a great talk. Let's get to the questions uh, and please, as usual, upvote as you see it. Uh, the current winner question that we have is, must we decide these categories by hand first and let the neural network decide which category is correct? Is it possible to use approaches like reinforce, reinforcement learning to let it create categories by itself? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, so, so I, I think it's um, so it's it's a matter of when the uh, when the when there is obviously discrete set of choices, but it's when we try to use these classifiers because classifiers sort of require a discrete set of choices, we are forced to make discrete choices. Um, it will be interesting to try to figure out what are the natural choices. And that will require balancing between sort of supervised and unsupervised, whether um, we can figure out the mechanism to do reinforcement learning by giving the right kind of feedback is not clear to me at the moment. Great. Uh, the next question, suppose you had searched through the possible space of uh, distortions would this have been less efficient than your unsupervised learning approach, which I have to say is pretty amazing? Yes, because um, the distortions are extremely small. Because distortions are small, um, it was very hard to detect. And um, what, we, what we were able to do, uh, combining the fluctuation and the um, graphics, was possible because of the statistics that we were able to gain. So by having um, many Brillouin zones and having the statistics, we were able to have confidence on the outcome because we were not fitting 
just one peak, but we were, pe- we, we were fitting 100,000 peaks. We had uh, confidence that this really reflect the data. But um, when you just try to search the distortion space, that's a huge phase space with this large number of atoms in the unit cell. So um, I, I'm not sure whether it would have been possible. Great, and very quickly, since we're out of time, the last question, what kind of computational background should students have if they want to participate in the data science school? Uh, for the summer school? Um, yes. I think we only need you to know uh, how to use Jupyter Notebooks. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And for that, I encourage everyone to uh, join the GDS sessions, data science sessions, if uh, you have, you need that kind of background. Uh, but thank you very much for a fantastic talk. And uh, it's a great honor to have you here. Before we go to the next speaker, I would like to uh, very briefly share my uh, slide about the data science uh, unit, the TOPCO group on data science uh, one last time. Um, I would also like to uh, thank uh, Professor Daniel Arovas for uh, recognizing the importance of data science and uh, quantum computing and uh, allocating this session uh, for, for that topic. And a big shout out to uh, all of the uh, uh, great uh, community, uh, committee members of GDS who have helped me found this unit. Uh, Jay Ren, uh, Corin Chair, Wolfgang uh, Lucert, uh, the upcoming, the incoming chair, and William Radcliffe, who uh, was just recently uh, elected as uh, the uh, vice chair, and everyone else who has been involved since uh, 2018 building this community. Um, I would like to encourage everyone who is interested in the topic to become a member of uh, GDS. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are uh, the fastest growing a topical group at APS, and we are already uh, the biggest topical group, uh, over 1,200 members. I see we have 2,000 uh, live audience watching this session, so at least there is 800 people there uh, who are not a member. Uh, if you're, uh, you're joining us for the first time, you may use this code uh, to get your free uh, first year. Uh, please follow us on social media with APS data science uh, handle. We have a YouTube channel. We have been uploading uh, webinars throughout the pandemic and we will continue to host events and we would uh, put the uh, talks uh, with our great speakers there on the channel. For uh, getting access to the full program, please go to this short link and you would be able to see all of our invited and uh, contributed uh, sessions. Thank you very much. Uh, Dan, I will pass it to you for introduce our <clears throat> next uh, speaker. Yeah, uh, 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 thank you, uh, thank you, Mohammed. I, uh, I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, uh, express my appreciation to the rest of the uh, DCMP, Division of Condensed Matter Physics uh, Executive Committee. Uh, and and uh, I think, you know, for, for, for many years, the March meeting was, was uh, largely dominated by DCMP. We're still the, the largest unit with uh, about 6,500 Members, but uh, as as the years have gone by, we've 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 seen many uh, other units uh, uh, start up, and some have sort of cleaved off DCMP, sort of uh, almost regard them as our our uh, children, and and uh, many of them are now uh, starting to eat our lunch. But uh, uh, you know, it's all good because uh, there's great physics there. Um, so I, I'd like to go on and uh, uh, and introduce uh, our, our last speaker, um, Professor John Preskill from Caltech. Um, uh, John Preskill is the Richard P. Feynman Professor of Theoretical Physics and the Director of the Institute for Quantum Information and Matter at Caltech. He's also an Amazon Scholar affiliated with the Amazon Web Services Center for Quantum Computing at Caltech. John is interested in how to build and use quantum computers and in how our deepening understanding of quantum information can illuminate issues in fundamental physics. You can follow him on Twitter uh, at Preskill. Um, he wasn't uh, so crass as to uh, provide the statistic, but I looked it up uh, uh, just yesterday and I found that he has 
uh, about 112,000 followers, and I'm one of them, and uh, he, he, he posts uh, excellent and very educational and interesting stuff there. So, um, uh, you know, become a follower. Uh, so, John, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Daniel, for the very kind introduction and the opportunity to speak at this terrific symposium. Quantum information science is a rapidly growing field of science and technology. That growth is reflected in the membership of the Division for Quantum Information, which is still growing steadily and has more than half of its members students, which bodes well for the future of the field. Quantum information is actually a rather broad subject. It encompasses quantum strategies for improving measurements, communicating with quantum states to protect our privacy, sending quantum states over long distances, and using quantum simulators and quantum computers to study properties of quantum matter and to solve hard problems. My focus in this talk will be on quantum computing. The way I like to look at the field of quantum information is that we're in the early stages of the exploration of a new frontier of the physical sciences, what we might call the complexity or entanglement frontier. We are now acquiring and perfecting the tools to create and precisely control very complex states of many particles, states so highly entangled, so complex that we can't simulate them with our most powerful digital supercomputers or understand their behavior very well with existing theoretical tools. And that opens opportunities for scientific discovery. Our conviction that this is a fruitful frontier to explore rests largely on two central ideas, quantum complexity, which is our basis for thinking that quantum computing will be powerful, and quantum error correction, our basis for believing that quantum computers can be scaled up to large systems that can solve hard problems. And both of those ideas rest on the underlying concept of quantum entanglement. That's the word we use for the characteristic correlations among the parts of a quantum system which we can think about this way. You can imagine a system with many parts. Let's say it's a book. If it's an ordinary classical book and it's 100 pages long with bits written on every page, then every time you read another page, you acquire another 1% of the information content of the book. And after you've read all the pages one by one, you know everything that's in the book. But suppose instead it's a quantum book written in qubits instead of ordinary bits with the pages highly entangled with one another, then when you look at an individual page, you see only random gibberish, which reveals very little information to distinguish one highly entangled book from another. And even after you've looked at all of the pages one by one, you've still discerned only a tiny bit of the information in the book. And that's because in the quantum book, the information does not reside in the individual pages. It's encoded almost entirely in the correlations among the pages. And to read the book, you have to collectively observe many pages at once. That's the essence of quantum entanglement. And it's a very different notion of correlation than we encounter in ordinary experience. Now, Part of what's so interesting about quantum entanglement is that in the case of a system with many qubits, it's very complex to describe in terms of ordinary bits. If I wanted to write down a complete description of all the correlations among the qubits in a system of just a few hundred qubits that are highly entangled with one another, I'd have to write down more bits than the number of atoms in the visible universe, which will never be possible. Now that in itself doesn't mean that quantum computers can do things that we find useful, but we do have several reasons for thinking that quantum computing is powerful. One is that we know of problems which are believed to be hard classically, which theoretically can be solved efficiently on a quantum computer. The best known example is finding the prime factors of a large composite integer. 
And we think factoring is hard because really smart people have been trying for decades to find better factoring algorithms. But still, the best algorithms that we have have a runtime which is super polynomial in the number of digits in the number to be factored. Theoretical computer scientists have given arguments based on reasonable assumptions, indicating that we can do a quantum computation of modest size and measure all the qubits and that by doing so, we are sampling from a probability distribution that we can't sample from efficiently by any classical means. But perhaps most tellingly, we just don't know how to simulate a quantum computer using a classical computer efficiently in general. And it's not for lack of trying. Physicists and chemists have been trying for decades to come up with better algorithms for simulating the behavior of a complex quantum system, but still the best algorithms that we have in the hardest instances have a runtime which scales exponentially with the system size, with the number of qubits. That's not to say that the power of quantum computing is unlimited. And in particular, we don't expect that quantum computers will be able to efficiently find exact solutions to the hard instances of NP-hard optimization problems. It was Richard Feynman 40 years ago now who suggested that a quantum information processor would be able to far surpass a classical computer for performing some tasks. And interest in the subject accelerated when Peter Shore discovered the efficient quantum factoring algorithm. The important thing that Shore's result emphasized is that the difference between hard and easy problems, the problems that we can solve and the problems we really can't hope to solve even with advanced technologies, uh, that distinction between hard and easy is what it is because we live in a quantum world, not a classical one. And so it's a compelling question to understand better what are the problems that are classically hard but quantumly easy. And we've learned a lot about that in the last 25 years. We still have a great deal more to learn, about, learn about it. But if you're a physicist, there's a natural place to look for such problems. That is the problem of computing or simulating the behavior of very complex quantum systems, which is just what Feynman had in mind. We expect that a quantum computer will be able to efficiently simulate any process that can occur in nature. And we don't think that's true of ordinary classical computers, which can't in general simulate very highly entangled matter. So with a quantum computer, we should be able to go further in studying the properties of complex molecules and materials, and also probe fundamental physics in new ways. For example, by simulating collisions between elementary particles or the quantum behavior of a black hole or the behavior of the early universe right after the Big Bang. So from a physics perspective, there are strong incentives to build quantum computers, but it's already been 40 years since Feynman first made the proposal. And only now are quantum computers getting to the point where arguably they can start to do interesting things. So evidently building quantum computers is very difficult. What makes it difficult is that we want a quantum computer to simultaneously fulfill several criteria that, we, that are nearly incompatible with one another. We want qubits to be able to interact strongly with one another so we can rapidly process the information the qubits encode, but we don't want the qubits to interact with their environment, which could cause errors in the computation, except that we do want to be able to control the qubits from the outside and eventually measure them to read out the final result of the computation. And it's quite difficult to realize a platform that satisfies all of these desiderata. So it's only through decades of progress in qubit design and fabrication and control engineering that we've gotten as far as we have. Now, a computer scientist might think of a qubit as an abstract object, just as we think about bits, but a qubit always has some physical realization and there are many possibilities. A qubit can be encoded in single photons or electron spins or the internal states of atoms. Those are all quite remarkable encodings because the information is carried by a very fundamental object and yet we've learned how to control that information 
pretty well, thanks to technological progress. Or a qubit could be encoded in a more complex system like a superconducting electrical circuit, which is also a rather remarkable encoding because in that case, the encoding involves the collective motion of billions of Cooper pairs. And yet we've learned how to control that object just as though it were a single atom. Now it's important that we continue to advance these different technological approaches to quantum hardware these and others as well. They all have their characteristic advantages and disadvantages and might find particular application areas. And we really don't have a clear understanding yet of what qubit technology has the best prospects for scaling up to large systems. Now, why did I say that it's important to keep a quantum computer isolated from the environment? That's because of the formidable enemy of the quantum computer, decoherence. A fundamental property of quantum information that distinguishes it from classical information is that we can't observe a quantum state without disturbing the state in some uncontrollable way. Uh, that's the origin of decoherence. Um, and it doesn't have to be we that observe the information. Any information leaking to the environment can drive that process that damages the quantum information. So during the course of a quantum computation, we would like to keep the information that's being processed nearly perfectly isolated from the outside world. And that's very difficult because our hardware is never going to be perfect. But we've understood at least theoretically, in principle, how to achieve that with the idea of quantum error correction. The essential idea is that if we want to protect quantum information from damage, then we should encode it non-locally in a highly entangled state with many parts. And then when the environment interacts with the parts locally, uh, just like with that 100 page quantum book, it can't discern the encoded information and therefore doesn't necessarily damage it. And furthermore, we've understood how to efficiently process quantum information which is encoded in this highly entangled form. The idea of quantum error correction was developed in the uh, 1990s and many people contributed, including Peter Shore. One of the heroes of the subject is Alexei Kataev, who had the vision over 20 years ago that if we can build the right kinds of materials, highly entangled topological materials, then quantum information encoded in such a system could be well protected against damage. And Kataev also pointed out that we don't necessarily have to fabricate these materials. We could simulate the behavior of those materials using whatever type of qubits we prefer, whatever we can best control. And that's still the most promising idea we have for scaling up quantum computing and protecting it from decoherence using quantum error correction. So what's the status of quantum computing now? Arguably it has reached a milestone which has been called quantum computational supremacy. This idea of computational supremacy is that we claim that classical systems are unable to simulate quantum systems efficiently in general. And there's a strong incentive to validate that claim to the extent that we can in laboratory experiments. And in 2019, the Google Quantum Group announced with some fanfare that they had achieved a demonstration of such quantum computational supremacy. What the Google Group did is they built a device called Sycamore, which has 53 working qubits laid out in a two-dimensional array such that entangling two qubit operations can be performed on neighboring qubits in the array. And they executed circuits of up to 20 layers of such entangling gates and then measured the qubits at the end. Because the device is noisy, when they make that final measurement, 499 times out of 500, they just see random junk, but once in 500 times, they get a useful result. And by performing the computation, the same computation millions of times in just a few minutes, they can extract a statistically useful signal. If one wished to 
simulate with a classical supercomputer what Sycamore is doing, it's costly. It arguably takes at least days and perhaps longer to perform the equivalent sampling task to what Sycamore does in just a few minutes. And furthermore, the cost of doing that classical simulation grows exponentially as we increase the number of qubits. So with a handful more qubits, the separation between the quantum and classical hardness of the task gets much larger. Now, the particular task that Sycamore performed was not of any practical interest other than for the purpose of demonstrating the superiority of the quantum device, but it is a notable achievement that the hardware is now working well enough to produce meaningful results in a regime where classical simulation is difficult to do. It's useful to have a word for the era in quantum information processing that's now dawning. The word NISC has been suggested. It means noisy intermediate scale quantum. Intermedi intermediate scale meaning systems of 50 qubits or more of sufficient scale that it's difficult by brute force to simulate what the quantum device does even with the best classical computation uh, that we can currently perform. But noisy reminds us that these devices are not error corrected and the noise places a limitation on their computational power. Now for physicists, NISC is exciting. It gives us a tool for exploring physics of highly entangled states in a regime that hasn't been experimentally accessible before. And it might have other more practical applications, but we're not really sure about that, at least not yet. NISC isn't something that is going to change the world by itself, not right away. It should be seen as a step towards more powerful quantum technologies that we're hoping to develop in the future. I am optimistic that quantum computing will have a transformative impact on society eventually, but we're not sure how long it's going to take to get there. It could be decades away. There is a kind of emerging paradigm of how we might make use of NIST technology to solve certain problems, a kind of hybrid quantum classical scheme. It makes sense to use our powerful classical supercomputers to the extent that we can and then boost that power with a kind of quantum coprocessor. It might work like this. We perform a modest scale quantum computation and then measure all of the qubits, the measurement outcomes are sent to a classical computer, which returns instructions to slightly modify the quantum computation. And that cycle is repeated until convergence, where the goal is to find an approximate minimum of some cost function for the purpose of solving an optimization problem. Now, as I said, we don't expect quantum computers to be able to efficiently find exact solutions to the hard instances of optimization problems, but it's possible it will be better at finding approximate solutions and finding them faster. So should we expect that NIST technology will be able to outperform our best classical methods for solving certain optimization problems? Well, we don't really know. We're gonna to have to try it and see how well it works. But it's really a lot to ask because the classical methods have been well honed over decades of development and the NIST processors are just becoming available for the first time now. Now we don't necessarily have to be so discouraged that the theorists are not able to assure us that NIST technology will have an advantage over our classical computing technology for some problem we care about. There are many examples in classical computing in which algorithms turned out to be practically useful where theorists were not able to validate that usefulness in advance. A good current example is deep learning. It's having a huge impact as we've been hearing in this session, uh, but theorists have not gotten very far in understanding why for some applications of interest, deep learning networks can be trained with reasonable efficiency. Now, quantum computing may be like that for a while. We'll be in the age of heuristic quantum algorithms with different things 
that we'd like to try without any great assurance of observing a quantum advantage. But as we experiment, we'll learn more and that may point us in the right direction to see some potentially useful applications. But it's going to be challenging in the near term if we're limited to something a border 100 qubits and circuit depths less than 100. It'll take a vibrant discussion among the hardware providers, the algorithm experts, and the potential end users to zero in on the most promising applications. Now, I've emphasized that 50 or so qubits is a kind of milestone for quantum computing where classical simulation of a quantum device becomes difficult, but we actually already have machines with thousands of physical qubits. I'm thinking in particular of the machine built by D-Wave Systems. That's not a general purpose quantum computer. It operates according to a different paradigm. It's what we call a quantum annealer, but it does solve optimization problems and it's an impressive feat of engineering. Uh, but so far we haven't seen convincing theoretical or experimental evidence that quantum annealers can achieve a scaling advantage relative to the best classical computers running the best algorithms to solve the same problems. So we are going to have to continue experimenting with quantum annealers to get a better grasp of their power. It's also natural to wonder about the potential applications of combining machine learning and quantum computing. It may be that if a deep learning network runs on a quantum device instead of a classical one, it can be more powerful for some applications of interest. We don't really know that's true. We're going to have to try it and see how well it works. We don't currently really have a convincing example of a practical end-to-end -end application of quantum machine learning with a significant advantage relative to classical methods for problems that people are interested in solving with machine learning. That's not to say that such an advantage won't be found. In fact, it may be most natural to expect quantum machine learning to be advantageous for solving quantum problems, for characterizing quantum systems and learning how to control them better, which relates to some of what we heard earlier in the session. It makes sense that if a quantum device will have an advantage in learning a function or a probability distribution, that advantage will be most apparent if that function or distribution is based on underlying quantum entanglement. Now, as I've emphasized, the NISC devices are not error corrected and the noise seriously limits their computational effectiveness. As I've also remarked, we know in the long term or expect that the solution to the problem of noise in quantum hardware will be quantum error correction. But quantum error correction has a heavy overhead cost in terms of the number of qubits that we need and the number of gates that we have to execute. Now, how high that cost is depends on the quality of our hardware on, and on the problem that we're trying to solve. But for the kinds of gate error rates that are feasible with current hardware, if we wanna solve problems for which we are quite confident that a quantum advantage will be achievable, that may require millions of physical qubits. So there's a daunting chasm between where we're likely to be in the next few years with perhaps hundreds of physical qubits to the millions of physical qubits that might be needed to solve problems of widespread interest. I can't uh, overemphasize what a big challenge this is and it's hard to predict the time scale for success in building truly scalable quantum computers that can solve problems which have a big practical impact. Now, in the meantime, it's quite important to try to achieve better gate error rates to improve the quality of the hardware. And on this slide, I've highlighted three approaches to doing so, which seem promising and are being pursued. In the case of both GKP codes and CAT codes, the idea is to encode a qubit not in a two-level system, but in a harmonic oscillator like the microwave resonators and superconducting circuits. 
For the case of GKP codes, one creates a highly non-classical state of the oscillator, that, which has a kind of grid structure in phase space. And that makes it possible to detect and correct small shifts or displacements in phase space that can result from noise, such as the loss of a photon from the oscillator. In the case of the CAT code, we encode a qubit in a superposition of two coherent states that are displaced relative to one another. For a sufficiently large displacement, the bit flip errors that cause us to confuse are the two possible coherent states become unlikely, but we also have to worry about the relative phase of the two coherent states, and that's not well protected in a CAD code, but we can add an extra layer of error correction on top to deal with those phase errors, at least potentially. The idea of the zero pi qubit is that we design a superconducting circuit such that as a function of the phase difference between the two superconducting leads, the energy stored in the circuit has two local minima, minima which can correspond to the two basis states of a qubit with a large barrier between those minima to protect against bit flips, but where in addition, because of the design of the circuit, the degeneracy of those two minima is well protected against fluctuations in the circuit parameters to protect against the phase errors. Now, all of these approaches are promising. They all present big challenges and they're really just getting started, but they're important to pursue because um, we really need better gain error rates and this could be a path toward that goal. Now, part of what we expect will be needed to improve the qubits of the future are materials advances and Improvements in materials require basic research and the time scale for success is hard to predict. And in addition to better materials, we also need new ideas about how to take advantage of the properties of those materials. Where I'm most optimistic about seeing some scientific progress from NISC technology is in quantum simulation, and in particular in the simulation or the study of the dynamics of highly entangled quantum states. We may in particular advance our understanding of quantum chaos using these near-term platforms, as that's something that's particularly difficult to simulate with classical computers. Now, there are two main modes of simulation that can be pursued digital or circuit-based quantum computation versus analog, where we have a programmable many-body Hamiltonian uh, that can be tuned. The analog approach is more mature at present. Both are important to pursue and develop. The digital method has greater flexibility. And as with other aspects of NISC science, the goal of these near-term simulators, whether digital or analog, should be to lay the foundations for more impactful simulations we hope to be able to perform in the future. From the perspective of our current understanding of the potential applications where quantum computing seems to have the greatest potential to have a positive impact on humanity is through the applications of quantum computers to quantum materials and chemistry, that is to quantum problems. Uh, progress in those areas could impact, for example, human health and agriculture and the sustainability of the planet. But these are very challenging goals and it will take a lot of effort and investment over an extended period to realize that dream. So let me sum up. We have arguably entered the NISC era of noisy, of uh, quantum information processing. And we can now start to experiment with these noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. And in particular, try out heuristic ideas for potential applications. And by experimenting with the devices, 
learn more about potential applications of the near-term technology, but we can't expect NIST to change the world by itself. Really the goal for near-term quantum platform should be to pave the way for bigger payoffs we expect to be able to see using future devices. In the meantime, lowering quantum gate error rates would have a very beneficial effect, both by lowering the overhead cost of quantum error correction in future devices and by extending the power of the NIST technology by enabling us to execute longer, more complicated algorithms. It's likely that the really transformative impact of quantum computing will need to be fault tolerant to incorporate quantum error correction and because of the high overhead costs that might still be a ways off. We don't really know for sure how long it will take. Progress towards the fault tolerance scalable quantum computer should be a high priority for the field of quantum technology. And I think if we put forth the effort towards that goal, we will in the end be amply rewarded. Uh, thanks a lot for listening to me. <clears throat> okay, um, thank you, John. Before we get to questions, I just want to uh, urge people first to you know upvote the questions that are there that you uh, would like to hear answered and also to attend the uh, after party as it were. There's a, uh, you should click a, a green button labeled join se after session networking where I, I hope we will have um, the majority of our speakers uh, who can uh, interact with you and answer additional questions. Um, uh, but let's uh, go on to, to, to some of these questions. Uh, let's see, the, the, uh, uh, the leading contender here, I'm not sure if this is a philosophical question, but uh, uh, for, for quantum computers to simulate everything, quantum theory has to be the most fundamental theory, but we know that it isn't, so shouldn't we focus on deriving the theory of everything first and then make a computer based on that theory? Good question. I was I worded it a little cautiously. I said we don't really know uh, for sure whether quantum computers can efficiently simulate any process that occurs in nature. And the most challenging, perhaps, aspect of that question is can quantum gravitational phenomena be efficiently simulated with quantum computers? Uh, it is a conjecture that it can be. Uh, the best evidence we have in favor of that conjecture is what the string theorists called ADS CFT duality, uh, which in essence says that quantum gravitational phenomena, at least in the certain settings where we best understand what's going on, have a dual description in terms of ordinary quantum theory without gravitation. There are many subtleties though in exactly how to make use of that duality. And we only partially understand the dictionary that relates the two descriptions of the theory. Now, my attitude is that one way or another, we're going to have really great news. It's possible that the conjecture that quantum computers can simulate everything efficiently is wrong. Well, that means that nature is even more computationally powerful than the current theory of quantum computation suggests, or it's possible that it's correct. And that means that we'll have the pleasure of using quantum computers to study and learn about any process occurring in nature, including things like what happens when a black hole evaporates. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, next question. Why is there not much focus on developing higher dimensional qubits, for example, n-level systems? Well, there, so the question was, uh, why do you always talk about qubits instead of systems with more than two levels? Yeah, in fact, uh, there is some interest in those higher dimensional systems. Uh, in the most um, commonly used design for superconducting qubits called a transmon. Uh, it's really just an anharmonic oscillator. And the standard approach is to use the ground state and the first excited state of that oscillator as the computational space. But there are higher levels which can be isolated, in particular the um, 
second excited state. And there have been some quantum algorithms that have run, which have taken advantage of that. Furthermore, if you encode uh, information in an oscillator, then potentially you can consider many modes of the oscillator. The important thing though about quantum computing is that in order to really unleash its power, we have to take advantage of the tensor product structure of the Hilbert space. So it wouldn't do to take say a single harmonic oscillator, which uh, in principle has an infinite dimensional Hilbert space and do all of our commuting, all of our computing there. Uh, rather in order to um, really have the full power of quantum computation, uh, we need to have a system which is a composite of uh, many systems. And uh, so two is the minimum number. Uh, if we consider many qubits in principle, uh, that enables us to do any quantum computation, just like with only bits, we can do any classical computation. So it's natural to uh, focus on that encoding. Um, thank you. Uh, what in, in your opinion, or which materials in your opinion uh, provide the a platform uh, which would be the current front runner for fault tolerant computation, uh, quantum computation? Well, I, you said material, but I'll interpret that a little bit more broadly. I mentioned several different uh, encodings of the qubit, the two which are most advanced in terms of the scale of the systems that people can build and operate and the reliability of the hardware are using trapped ions for quantum computing and superconducting circuits. Uh, they're roughly comparable, both in terms of the scale of the systems and the reliability of the two qubit entangling gates. It's hard to say uh, which one has the best long-term prospects. Uh, one advantage of superconducting circuits and other solid state approaches, which is worth noting, is that the gates are much faster. And because quantum computing has such a large speed up for some problems over classical computing, we don't necessarily worry about that first thing. But in the long run, if we can make the gates, you know, 100 or 1,000 times faster, uh, we'll be able to get the answer that much faster. So uh, for that reason, I have, well, not only for that reason, I have, um, it's a little bit closer to my heart to use uh, superconducting circuits rather than ion traps in the longer term. Um, thanks. Uh, I wanted to squeeze in another uh, question of mine. So you, you, you're probably uh, uh, aware of the recent uh, archive by uh, uh, Pan and Zhang uh, entitled Simulating the Sycamore Supremacy Circuits. Um, and and they, they use this uh, highly efficient tensor con contraction you know, program for classically simulating the, the, the Google's uh, quantum supremacy experiment, as I understand it. I'm wondering if you could say a few things uh, explaining what that is and what is your opinion of the significance of- It's a very nice paper by Pan and Zhang. Um, and you described it more or less accurately. They use tensor network methods, build on uh, the work of, of others using tensor network methods to simulate quantum circuits. In particular, there was excellent work in that direction by the Alibaba group. Uh, last year, but uh, they add some uh, additional insights. And in particular, they argue that it's possible to generate many samples from the distribution of uh, measurement outcomes for a circuit like Sycamore uh, at a cost, which is not much larger than getting a single sample. There's a catch though, which is that the samples that they generate with their algorithm are not independent, they're strongly correlated with one another. There are many nuances to uh, comparing uh, that method to, uh, to what Sycamore does, but strictly speaking, it does not perform the same sampling task. So I, uh, I use that as cover when I said that, uh, you know, it would be hard with today's technology to use a, uh, the best supercomputers we have to uh, perform the same task. It's a nice paper though. Um, all right, let, let, let's have one more question and then uh, we will uh, retire to the 
Barco loungers in the uh, in in the after party uh, meeting room, where I hope uh, more questions will be answered. Uh, so um, uh, this question says, I'm interested to know why you said quantum computers will be useful for certain physical scenarios like the interior of a black hole. Was that a speculation or are there reasons to believe this is the case? Well, it's a bit of a stretch. It's a bit of a stretch uh, because, um, but it's, uh, so I guess it's fair to call it a speculation. What it is based on is the dualities that I mentioned in answer to a previous question between quantum gravity and non-gravitational quantum theories. Uh, in fact, uh, we haven't yet understood well enough uh, what those dualities tell us about the interior of the black hole. But I think it actually, for me, uh, as a physicist who actually has a history of interest in uh, particle physics and gravitation, and including black holes, a particularly exciting opportunity at some time in the future, I think, will be using quantum computers to simulate quantum gravitational phenomena. And we have some idea how to get started with that, thanks to this uh, ADS-CFT duality. Uh, but there's a lot of fleshing out we'll need to do before that becomes practical, not to mention that it will require um, fault tolerance scalable quantum computers since it's a fairly hefty simulation in terms of computational cost. Well, let me ask one, one, one last question uh, here on the board. Once the fault tolerance error is reached, what, uh, what, will all the uh, NISC work in progress be, become obsolete? Uh, I don't think so, um, but um, it won't be the cutting edge of computation anymore uh, just because the fault tolerant quantum computers will be able to uh, handle computations with uh, many more gates and more qubits and the uh, many of the problems that we'll be able to solve with uh, fault tolerant quantum computers will be beyond the reach of what we expect to do with NIST. I'll put in one caveat, which is this is all premised on the assumption that we can't make strides by many orders of magnitude in the quality of quantum hardware. Maybe someday we will, uh, the hardware will be so much better than we have now that quantum uh, error correction will not be so essential, uh, just as, uh, well, it's not quite so true anymore as it used to be, but in the case of classical computation, although back in the 1950s, uh, you could argue uh, that if you wanted to get a computer to scale up based on vacuum tubes, uh, you would have to use some kind of error correction protocol but the hardware became much, much better. So error correction wasn't needed for a long time. Um, potentially something like that could happen with quantum computing, uh, but if it doesn't, the cutting edge of computation will involve using quantum error correction to make computers scalable so they can solve hard problems. All right, beautiful. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, so with that, I think we'll call the, uh, you know, the presentation section, uh, uh, closed. I want to uh, thank my uh, co-host, uh, uh, Professor Mohamed Sultan Yeha from uh, Boston University and and uh, GDS. Um, uh, now, uh, I know it's getting late for some people, but I invite you all to join us in the post-session networking room. Uh, so I, I hope you all understand how, how, how to get there. I hope uh, all our speakers can, can join us there. Uh, and uh, 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 Freeman people, if, you, if any of the speakers have questions, uh, please uh, uh, please help them. Okay, uh, thanks to all our, our, our speakers. This was a, it was a wonderful session. And uh, uh, so let's uh, go on to have some more questions. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, okay. Mohammed. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Great talks. <laughs>